everyone and welcome back to the electrifying day two of Open DI Summit 2023 or Open Data and Infrastructure Summit 2023 where we're not just an event but we are sparking a revolution. We closed out day one with an exciting rap battle. Congratulations to the West Coast team. It was such a close battle, but you guys took the $1,000 prize and it was well-deserved. Everyone did a fantastic job and it was a great way to celebrate when the hard work of the day's job of fighting concentrated control was over. Now let's remember why we hear Open DI isn't faceless. It's a beacon of hope for a decentralized future. And we are on a mission to break free from concentrated control. The IT landscape is owned by 90% of it is owned by some of the biggest tech companies. And we want to break that power back to the people, decentralize it back to the people. So it is controlled by the many and not the few, the way that it is supposed to be. Now, today, day two, we're talking mostly about AI and machine learning. It is going to be so exciting. We're talking ZK proofs, layer two technology by some of the brightest minds in the industry. We've got Singularity Net in the house. We've got Dr. James. We've got Polygon, Neo4j, Lilypad. We've got a neuroscientist. We've got crypto talent groups. We've got BYAI, journalists, Xbox, date chat AI. You can even learn how to use AI to help you with your dating game. We've got dream tech. We've got some cyber teams, dev team space, Oasis network, and so much more. You are not going to want to miss it. It's going to be an incredible up-to-date information on what is going on in artificial intelligence and machine learning, also known as AI and ML. 
And don't forget, today we're ending the day with the esports competition. They will be battling for $2,000 for the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate Tournament. We've got some of the best players in the world. You're not going to want to miss it. So without further ado, let's kick off day two. Another reminder, the mission of today is to break free from concentrated control. And we have another speaker working towards that goal. So get ready to be inspired by our next talk. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to what will assuredly be an engaging panel discussion featuring two distinguished experts in the field of artificial intelligence. So we have Tufi Saliba and Ben Gertzel. Today we have the unique opportunity to delve into the ever evolving landscape of AI, exploring its current state, future trends, and the crucial role of decentralized technologies. So I'm excited to facilitate this conversation, examining the complexities of AI's impact on society, the challenges it presents, and the innovative solutions that are shaping the future. So without further ado, let's jump, jump into this discussion with our esteemed guests, Tufi and Ben. So Tufi, as the co-founder and CEO of HyperCycle and Ben as a co-founder of both HyperCycle and SingularityNet, could you each spend just a few minutes sharing your general thoughts on the current state of AI and the key trends shaping its future? Well, so Tufi can start go ahead. with Ben. Ben, go ahead. Please. Okay. Yeah, regarding AI, so the current state is best understood in terms of the historical context and, and, and the future prospects. So the historical <clears throat> historical context is, I mean, the AI field has been around since the 1950s and arguably before that in, in many ways, but the 50s when the field got its name, I entered the field in the 80s. And there's been a variety of paradigms and approaches proposed since then. There's been neural nets attempting to simulate how the brain works at occasionally a serious level, usually a very coarse level of, of accuracy. I mean, there's logic systems that try to emulate models of, you know, systematic, scientific, or rational reasoning. There's evolutionary learning and artificial life systems that, that, that try to replicate some of the you know, self-organizing growing ac ac activity in, in the, the biological world. I mean, outside the, the human brain and body and all these things have been the subject of active research and commercial deployment going way, way back. I mean, the first commercial AI yeah, systems were out there in the, in the 70s and then early, early 80s. Now, what we've seen you know, in the last 10 years, and even more so the last few years, we've seen some of the historically well known AI approaches get refined and tweaked and improved, and then rolled out on massive amounts of data and, and massive amounts of compute power. And we see that in many cases, these methods then start doing, you know, what their creators always, always thought they would do in the first place. So it, it seems well, yeah, a lot of minor changes and adjustments need to be made to code and algorithms, but by and large, the biggest missing ingredient from the, the deep neural networks of the 1960s was just a lot of data and, and, and you know, a lot of uh, GPU servers running, running in, in parallel. So now we're, we're seeing what happens when these historical algorithms get updated to modern compute and data infrastructure, but I think we're only partway through this process, right? I mean, I mean, so we've seen certain kinds of deep neural nets start to work really, really well as with convolutional neural nets for face recognition and generative AI in, in you know, image, video, music, and, and, and text and, and, and so forth. I think in the next few years, we're gonna see logic-based AI systems. We're gonna see evolutionary AI systems. We're seeing, you know, hyper-vector-based, high-dimensional computing AI systems. We're seeing a bunch of the other historical AI paradigms also start to do their thing in ways they haven't been able to before when they hit modern data and 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 processing power. And this, uh, it's reaching the point where the technology is being used to accelerate 
the development of the technology, which is, is fascinating. Like, uh, you know, LLMs can be used to help with coding. Um, right. They don't do the hardest part of coding for you, but they simplify scripting and, and, and IO and app development and, and, and so forth, right? So we're seeing the AI already makes it easier to do some parts of the work you need to roll out and, and, and test and develop the AI. Like you can, you can use AI to automatically develop unit tests or even system tests for a block of code right. that, you, that you've written, right? And all so all this accelerates things. And so this, this finally it highlights the question of who owns and controls all this AI, right? And the, the default at the moment is a few big tech companies in the US and China own and control it. Obviously, these companies working closely in in connection with intelligence agencies and such in their respective uh, countries of, of US and China. So it's like the it's not exactly the old military industrial establishment, but it's, 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 it's the new big tech establishment, but there's plenty of back end connections with big government for better and worse. And, you know, that's that's who's yeah. doing it at the moment. And this means very small groups of people having huge power over the next stages in AI development. So look at what happened in OpenAI over the last week. Sure, I sure. mean, you saw it's either Sam Altman, one guy, you know, great guy, brilliant guy, but it's still one guy with his own peculiarities like all of us individuals, right? Or these six jokers on the former OpenAI board who again i'm sure well qualified people in the in their own way and I, I, I know some of them but I, I mean you know if open ai had really created a human level agi an artificial general intelligence that can generalize beyond its training data in, into you know new unprecedented frontiers right if if open AI had made the breakthrough to artificial general intelligence it would be ridiculous to have this bunch of jokers on the former open ai board in, in charge of the breakthrough to AGI to the next level of, of AI that can go beyond what we fed into it and then and then apply its own steps no, forward. Yeah. We'll, we'll get more but into Microsoft, those issues as we yeah, go through. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Satya Nadella is a nice guy too, great CEO, but do we want the Microsoft board in charge? Well not not exactly. We don't want them to be driving the singularity with their shareholder value as their prime directive, even though they're not bad and evil people. I mean, that's their job. That's the role they're in. And that, so that brings us to what Tufi is going to talk about. And I'll talk about a bit more in, in a later in this panel, right? Which is yeah. building technologies that at least make it feasible, technically and economically possible for the, the next stage of AI development, the, the, the movement from generative AI we have today to the AGI of tomorrow, we want it to be possible for that to roll out on decentralized infrastructure that's owned by everyone and no one and controlled by everyone and no one in the same sense that Bitcoin is, but even even stronger senses it as well, because we've got something not as dominated by a small number of whales as Bitcoin. And indeed, this was indeed. why we launched SingularityNet in 2017, which partly solved the problem. And now we're launching, we've launched NewNet last year, and now we've launched HyperCycle this year, which solve other pieces of the problem of making the decentralized infrastructure for AGI. So that if, you know, if I make an AGI breakthrough with my OpenCog Hyperon project, or someone else makes an amazing AGI breakthrough, you know, this can be rolled out on a decentralized infrastructure. And the cool thing is this is being done, you know, in the open source domain. So anyone can participate, anyone with suitable technical knowledge and ability and, yeah. you know, or willing to put in the time and to some assistance it, for jump in and, and participate in, in create, you know, creating either the next AGI or the decentralized infrastructure on which it, it operates. And so Tufi, Tufi had some AI background, but came into our partnership most heavily with a, you know, blockchain computer security and decentralized computing backgrounds. So that's been a fascinating uh, sort of meeting of the minds and experience basis to to collaborate. The conversions. Hypercycle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we've, we've, had, we've had the conversions back in 2000 and 
16, 17, uh, Stephen Ibaraki introduced us at the time, and uh, he's one of the visionaries that not a lot of people understand and not a lot of people appreciate as much as uh, they should, I think. some Those that they do, they appreciate him a lot. Uh, and uh, he just kind of saw that there's two brain waves there kind of going in some directions. Like, okay, you guys need to meet. Um, you know, I feel like uh, it's it's been... Great. We tried many times. Many people they look at hypercycle. They're like, "Oh, hey, look at that! Like, overnight success or whatnot." Uh, but uh, we've tried before COVID to launch a few things, and then COVID came, slowed it down, and then uh, as soon as it was over, uh, you know, was that the AGI summit in California that it occurred to us that maybe it's about time to get going. And then uh, at the at the hackathon, actually, it was a hackathon in Wyoming when 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 uh, we, we've uh, pretty much uh, decided that that's what we need to uh, get uh, the ball rolling on. And, uh, and it was at the time that uh, uh, Ben, he had said that, it's like, okay, we're, well, it's about time we build the singularity on the IP. Do you want to be involved? And I'm like, dude, I drop in everything. And I just like go in, in that direction. And I, and I sure did. Uh, October 2022, I, I pretty much uh, focused uh, solely on that. And I feel like... Uh, it's been it's been a great ride. Um, yeah, so I feel like the state of uh, AI. To answer your question, uh, the current state of AI, I've, I think it's like probably the most exciting time when you realize that the vast majority of people they they start believing in that for the very first time in the history of humanity or even the history of this planet Earth, folks they get to believe that. There's a species that can create another species that can outlive it. Uh, well, sure, if you were to ask, uh, you know, uh, Ben, Tufi, and Robert, 20 years ago, we probably would have told you that, but people wouldn't believe us. Right now, if you walk down the street and tell that story to, to 99% of people, they believe you, which is super exciting time that people are starting to believe that we, as a human, humanity or civilization, we're on the verge to create that thing that's going to outlive us. So I, I think that is the most exciting thing of the future mm -hmm. of AI, that it's not, we're just creating things that can help us, it can outlive us. That's our baby, that's our common baby. Let's make the best out of it. We can make the best baby ever. And it doesn't have to be, and it's, it's, it's not, um, I mean, even if you were to look at the genetics, if you were to actually, have a baby just from the ear, it's not probably going to be a good baby. You need a baby from the entire body. So that's another thing where you don't want like a baby that is just from one central entity or whatnot. So so, so we need to get that uh, passed on. And, and we really think there's a lot of beautiful intelligence across the globe and it needs to be passed on through proper decentralized governance. And we're working tirelessly on that and uh, we're, we're getting close. So, Yeah, amazing. So... Thanks. Yeah. Thank you both. Uh, so Tufi, you mentioned Toda IP. Uh, and then, so given that Hypercycle is leveraging Toda IP as a ledgerless blockchain, can you elaborate on how Toda IP enhances the capabilities of AI to AI communication? And how do you see that technology contributing to the evolution of the AI landscape? Sure. So if we were to take a step back, us, uh, humanity, when two people, they're doing work or any uh, groups that they're doing, if you were to do any kind of work, whether you make shoes or you make uh, a computer or whatnot, or you spend the amount of time, you expect that the other one's going to appreciate that. And how do they compensate you? Do they actually do, do you trade things or do you do they give you money? And if they were to give you money uh, for a long time, we depended on certain elements of how that money looks like. So if they give you cash money, you give them the work. So you make sure that and then when uh, the electronic world uh, came to happen uh, people that they are not in the same room they're exchanging money they had to depend on uh, a third party that it's called the bank or ledger or registry or whatnot that or, or an escrow that can ensure that rob has done the work and therefore rob deserves the money at that time and then you also depend on some legal infrastructure in that government and contract and all of these things but we're very slow when you look at uh, how AI needs to talk to another AI and needs to subcontract another AI in a sub-second and get the results in sub-second. 
it has a window of about 100 milliseconds that needs those results from someone else who claims to know those type of expertise or know those things. If it's going to depend on a third party, simply by pinging that third party and coming back, it's going to take more than 100 milliseconds. So even time-wise, is not feasible, let alone the scalability of how many they can go to that central ledger and depend. So, so from feasibility perspective, it's not possible to have to go to a third party. Um, Toda IP enables the true peer-to-peer, -peer, where you're able to have the instructions embedded inside the smart contract within the 64 kilobyte file, where the actual packet, as it's being traversed from one party to the next, all the cryptographic proofs, they're also included in submitting a penny that is conditional on the work to be done by the other party to be re-dispensed. Re I know it's a mouthful, but you're recording this, so people, if they don't catch it, they can rewind it a bit. <laughs> but it's effectively... Um, that, that cryptographic proof enabled you as a receiver to only spend that penny if you have done the work, if you have done the proof, if you have a proof of the work that was requested that you can respend it. Of course, there's something that happens on a global level when that event happens, if you were to respend that penny, but the instantaneously of you sending the penny and the other one verify that you are not lying about have, owning this penny, it's in within a hundred milliseconds. If you want to respend it, you need to wait for something that takes like three seconds or whatnot. So you need to keep some sort of balance. So what we've done with HyperCycle, we've built that tiny little container, the 64 kilobyte, that can transmit that value, whatever the value that you choose it to be. You want it to be US dollars, by all means. You want it to be Bitcoin. You want it to be AGIX. You know? So the, the best partnership that we have done is that with Singularity that's spent enormous amount of time to build a lot of the, the rest of the components. And then we figured the one that they relied on, which they hope that by that this time that Ethereum would actually enable that peer to peer. Well, if Ethereum didn't do that, but they probably do other great things. That's great. We come in and say like, let's enable that component. So it's actually peer to peer to transmit that value. So we're completing that piece of the puzzle, not reinventing it. And that's precisely what uh, hypercycle is doing in that equation. So amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Tufi. Uh, okay. So, uh, Ben turning back to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, given so that, that's, uh, from just... my own experience. No, continue. Oh, just, so I want to reframe just a little bit. We'll get more into, you know, the role of singularity net and the projects that you've been working on. Uh, for now, just in terms of setting the ground here, I wanted to ask, because you have extensive experience uh, with uniquely with the interplay between AI research and the dynamic world of AI startups and how that is all contributing to the way that AI is evolving and needs to evolve. So how do you see that landscape evolving and what emerging technologies or methodologies do you find particularly promising or useful? Well, I, I think that to get from here to AGI, which is my primary focus as an AI researcher, although applying narrower and more data set bound AI technologies is also, in, it's also interesting and, 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 and important, but I think to get from here to AGI will still require a series of, of research breakthroughs. Now, maybe not huge ones on the level of the invention of, of quantum mechanics or, or the computer or something, but, but still there's, you know, there's a number of strong PhD thesis level research breakthroughs that are needed to get from here to an AGI. It's not pure engineering, although a lot of engineering is required. On, on the other hand, AI now, without any more fundamental research, does enough things that already with just the AI that already works. I mean, we could, we could start loads and loads of, of highly profitable and impactful businesses in, 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 in different verticals, right? So if we want to look at how AI goes forward from here, I'd want to separate a little bit the research work from the application work, because as far as research goes, most of the big application, big breakthroughs happened in 
academia by PG students and, and, right. and professors labs. And then it's open source code and it's, you know, publications po posted on the internet for, for, for all to see now transformer neural nets, which is the main technology breakthrough underlying GPT mo T models and chat GPT for large language models and all that. So that was, that was a step forward in Google brain, but it was, I mean, it was building on LSTMs and b b building on a whole bunch of other technologies for, you know, predicting the next token using, using recurrent neural nets, which were all, all academic work. Right. So I, I, I think on the whole, you'd say the tech startup world, which you mentioned has not done well with advancing AI research forward which is right. not surprising because that's not what it's what it's there for right so you have you have big company labs like it like a google brain or an ibm research or microsoft research or something or or or, or you have universities or you may have you know differently organized projects and independent researchers or singularity net which is a foundation but they, you need you need a bit of loose free play for making research progress, it seems like, and tech startup, which I've been involved in a number of times and singularity net has a bunch of spinoffs now, which are more in the traditional tech startup vein. I mean, you, you get a constant struggle for survival against adversaries and pretty much you, you, you need to be focused on whatever is your, your product goal and finding product markets fit and so forth. So in terms of rolling out applications of AI technology that already works in a, in a fairly mature way. I mean, small tech startups seem to be the best way to do that. The, the issue in the current tech scene in, in, in the U S which is where tech startups have been most successful as you, you, U S and China really. And I mean, the issue has been basically every tech startup with very few exceptions just gets acquired by a handful of big tech companies right and i mean with the with the relaxation of antitrust law in in, in the us under the reagan administration most industries have seen consolidation i'm mean, even like you know trucking or, or toothpaste or something every industry has seen massive consolidation just due to the way the capitalist economy works in the era of modern technology without some government oversight but right. in big tech it's been if anything, a little more extreme. So startups have sort of served as, you know, recruiting pipelines and as, as, as uh, you know, technology innovation centers for big tech, which then buys the most successful ones, which, you know, it works. It makes, it makes the founders money. It makes the, gives good jobs to the, the employees of the startups, but it, it leads us toward this situation where a few tech companies are, are, you know, within a few steps of owning and controlling the, 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 the singularity. Right. And so then yeah, yeah. the crypto space with I, ICOs and, and the liquidity pools and various innovative economic models has somewhat promised to offer an alternative to this big tech company slash VC centered way of doing tech startups. On, on, on the other hand, it's got its own peculiarities of, 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 of course. I mean, you're in a way doing an ICO funded thing is like doing a, it has some similarities while they're not securities involved, the utility tokens involved. There's still some similarities to doing like a publicly listed company at the startup pre-product phase, right? Which, which ha has a lot of peculiarities to it. Cause you have all these people owning your token. who don't fully understand what you, what, what you're doing. And they don't have the reassurance of seeing a product with the, with a whole lot of customers and a mature business model out, out, out there. Right. So, yeah, I, I think we're going to see a complex mix of you know, university and independent research, tech startups, big companies, and, and then innovation of the blockchain space. And one of the things that will let this mix all contribute together is the power of open source, right? Because if 
yeah. if to yeah. the extent you have open source code and openly published papers, then the fact that you have these different entities with their own complex mix of incentives and business models collaborating, I mean, to the extent they're collaborating on the same open source code bases, right? I mean, I mean, then to some extent, the different motivations and business models can all can all, all come out in the wash, although it's a very complex washing machine sometimes, right? Like, sure. like with that, with that, with, with, oh. like with that, with Android, which is open source, but there's a really open part. Sure. Then, there's a, then there's a Google part and there's proprietary extensions. So. Well, it's, it, it's interesting, I think in here, how hypercycle and, you know, the partnership with singularity net uh, is opening up new possibilities for producing software, open source software, that's doing novel things uh, that can start building this uh, decentralized network of AI. So maybe it's a good time to lean in yeah, to the hacker yeah. challenges. So the, the topics that we're focusing on for HyperCycles, a hackathon for OpenDI involve federated learning and incremental learning uh, on peer-to-peer -peer networks and genetic algorithms from automatic prompt engineering. So in that context, what do you see the most pressing challenges in AI development today and, and how can these challenges be addressed? And we're thinking here also of speaking to, you know, grad students in universities who are a lot of the people who will be participating in this hackathon. So they're coming from a research background, but are interested in exploring the possibilities of AI development. Yeah, I, th I think that, I mean, to get beyond, I, 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 I get, again, though, I want to separate AGI R&D from application sure, development, sure, sure. which are both, both both important. So, I mean, from an application development standpoint, I think there's a sort of very narrow, but very topical need to, to get beyond simplistic uses of, of LLMs to, to, to do, to do things. And I mean, the need for such fine grained prompt engineering, where you have to tweak prompts to LLMs and with it specific you know, to each model, the way to refine a prompt for Llama 2 is not the same as, as to write a prompt for, refine a prompt for, for Claude or something, right? So, I, I mean, I think the need to get beyond this highly refined human prompt engineering per each model or model version is is clear. And you mm -hmm. having systems that can automatically take a sort of prompt for a prompt and turn it into a detailed prompt is is important. So like 3D, 3D GPT is an example of that where they, they use a neural net to take a sketchy human prompt into a more refined prompt, which contains a bunch of configuration instructions to configure the 3D graphic engine blender to create a 3D model or something, right? So I, I mean, that, that, so there they use a neural net to go from a simplified prompt to a more refined prompt. Now, using an evolutionary algorithm for this has some more interesting aspects because an evolutionary algorithm has some creative flair that that today's deep neural nets tend not to because of the way they're, they're more narrowly trained for their data set so maybe if you're doing an art application of llms you get some funky creativity there through the the creative prompt that the evolutionary algorithm co comes up with and then submits to 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 an llm so i, I think we're you can also integrate LLMs and other deep neural nets with knowledge graphs, and then you're having a complex prompt, which includes calls into knowledge graph API in order to help, again, turn a simplified prompt into a more refined prompt. And yeah. again, having an automated system, having an automated system for composing a complex prompt that involves references to external knowledge graphs and other knowledge repositories. This is, this is all I think quite interesting. It lets you do a class of applications that you can't do by just making a fixed or can't conveniently do by making this like fixed human generated prompts to LLMs and, and yeah. wrapping them up in, 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 a, in a web interface. Then I think on the, on the AGI side, you know, if, if you believe as I do that, current LLMs and deep neural nets are part of the story about AGI, even if they're not AGIs. So let, let's, let's say that some 
further derivative of current large language models could be between 15 and 40 percent of an AGI architecture, right? De de depending on, on, on how you want to slice it. So then even if you think it could be 70 percent of it, which I don't think is, is plausible, as long as you don't think it's 100 percent or or 0.1 percent, right? I mean, then then it's quite interesting to think about how to take other AI paradigms and methods combine them together with with large large language models and, and see how you can you can boost up the intelligence and I mean taking LLMs and sticking them into a whole integrated AGI architecture I mean this is one of the things we're looking at with OpenCog Hyperon it's more than you can do in, in a few days or a few weeks of a hackathon but there's a lot of interesting experimentation you can do with plugging LLMs and other deep neural nets in with other sorts of AI tools, which, which can be done in a few, few intense days and, and a few weeks. And arguably this help, helps build ingredients that can then be further improvised upon and assembled together to work toward API. Yeah, very cool. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So Tufi, that I think it's actually works well with the other two challenges focused more on learning uh, algorithms in, in the context of peer to peer net networks. So maybe you could uh, comment on, you know, what you see the possibilities are there, or whether there's synergies or intersections between these approaches that could lead to novel AI solutions. How do you see that picture evolving? Sure. Um, so I think you, you've got, for example, in a genetic algorithm or um, uh, in the evolutionary computation, there's uh, also an extension in human-based genetic algorithm when you actually, the human is the innovator and then the, the, another human is the validator and then there's the machine that is the actual uh, running the, the execution to get the actual, uh, the, the, the whole uh, triangle as uh, things get, they get evolved. But then in this specific uh, example, uh, if you were to substitute the human by different developer, for example, and if you were to have a certain uh, developer that is in, you know, um, Nicaragua built something that is super cool. And it, if you send uh, a certain input, they send you the output. Um, there's this dilemma that existed for a long time, which I, I, I tried to talk about in the, in that, in my, my uh, 15 minutes ago, and I kind of interjected. So for us, a human, we rely on that third party. But if you want those machines to talk to each other in that peer to peer in a sub second, wh why, why is it the case? Well, if you have machine A trying to tell machine B, can you do work for me? Machine B is going to say, why would I? Well, if machine A is going to say, I'll pay you. Machine B is going to be like, you're right. I'm, I'm going to do the work and you're never going to pay me. Remember, those are strangers, like even humans are strangers. They don't necessarily trust each other. Imagine machines that they're like completely strangers. So how can you actually have a smallest component of your AI participating in some other small component of someone else's AI? So why would you want to do that? Well, you can monetize that computation because your smallest component can become one of your you know, workforce that it's actually doing work for some other AI without necessarily divulging some of your intellectual property. If you don't want it to be divulged, there's an input that comes out, output that come out and effectively. But how is that going to work? So there's this dilemma. If you do the work first, you may never got, get paid. But if you say pay me first, you may take the money and never do the work because they don't necessarily trust you. Right. So if you were to depend on a third party, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of costs, and every time we depend on a third party, we know what happens. You know, at the end of the day, they end up betraying you and trying to manipulate the whole thing. So, um, so if you were to insert the cryptographic proof inside the network packet, which is effectively what you do with the IP, then you're able to get the other party to do the work in a subsequent world. Um, now, you can imagine some creative developers, if they were to have certain components of their AI to, to start relying on some other components, and uh, the emergence of the two is, it has a higher, uh, you know, let's say, accuracy rate than 
each and every one of them. Um, then I guess both of them, they can have higher intelligence if they were to cooperate that way. There's also a scenario where one AI has got a lot of money. The other AI has got a lot of intelligence. The one that's got a lot of money end up spending that money to get some of the intelligence of the other one and to enable that economy of, of course, on the smallest component, it's, uh, it's uh, needed to be in a, in a sub-second world without having any friction, without having any transaction fees whatsoever. The, the network can charge you as you make money. So if you were to win, you, the network can charge you the same royalty, let's say 1%, but if you don't, then you don't. Because it prevents the DDoS attack by construct, and that's how it's capable of doing that. So those innovations are not necessarily available to the vast majority of AI developers. And to answer your question, when we introduced those things in like hackathons, we were super delighted to get more deep in discussions with them and try to get them across. Because as we're innovating those elements and bringing them into production, um, barely the practitioners have heard of them. And academics, they haven't heard of them yet. So it, it's nice to see academics start jumping onto them and enhancing them. Because at their infancy, they can require a lot of enhancements. There is no way that what we've built is the the best wheel out there. <laughs> if you look at the creations of the wheel, it doesn't look as uh, you know uh, uh, as good as it is today. So there's a lot of innovations to be done of what we have, uh, what we are presenting, and uh, but so far it seems to add a lot of value to. A lot of uh, algorithms at a at a micro scale, but it's also at, a, at at some macro scale. The component that I'd like to add here, Robert, is that uh, what uh, I've noticed something or some common element between many contributors to partake in building a system that can be resilient, can be good for humanity, and can have the whole decentralized governance of AI and whatnot. Um, I truly feel like just uh, education alone doesn't cut it to, to get people to know that. It seems like a combination of um, education and economic factors. So when you start aligning the two, then folks, they're able to help a lot better because they have their own obligations and the things that they have to worry about. And then at the same time, when you satisfy the fear you need to satisfy some people's greed and all of these things so then we have you satisfy some of the components that drive people to kind of push in that same direction i feel we're a lot closer than ever to get to what we uh, what we hope to to get to and uh, and hopefully a lot of researchers they would find it exciting try to enhance it i, I truly hope so and i welcome uh, anyone who, who's uh, encouraged to take what we have and and make it better, uh, it deserves to get a lot better and it has a lot of potential. So we, we, we want to get it there. So it sounds like, uh, <clears throat> the, the opportunity you see with a network like, uh, Toad IP enabled hypercycles is to enhance all the existing algorithms and give a sort of richer, diverse network that these AI algorithms can network into. Uh, without the the need to uh, sort of set up agreements with uh, third third parties and all this complicated stuff, it can just happen directly and and allow the, the growth of these the, you know the intelligence of these models to increase in an organic way. Is that would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like imagine that there's like uh, uh, the initial request from one machine to the next. Let's say you spend the one machine would spend a penny, would tell the other machine, hey, can you do this computation? The other one, yes. Okay, great. But then the next request would be like, here, I'm sending you like 1,600 pennies of the same amount of work. Do you have an army to do it in a fraction of a second? And then that other one would be like, well, I've built already very good relationship with folks that I don't have to go and run the transactions through each and every one of them, I have them all under my same exact hardware machine that I can just deploy that software and run them. How often do you want that? The other responder machine can say, well, I would want that every minute if you're capable or every second if you're capable of providing me with 600 of those, then it's able to deploy those very quickly. So 
So imagine that that is not part of hypercycle today, for example, but imagine somebody would be like, oh, I want to take what you guys have built and kind of enhance it to that level. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, you can. So those are the kind of stuff that you would think of how one thing can evolve from one thing to the next and can run like phenomenal amount of computation and the emergence is what they really after and the emergence is what gets that intelligence to be elevated to the next level. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, ask if we have a little bit more time. Uh, so I know, Ben, you're pressed for time. If we have a bit more time, then I can add a couple of questions. Otherwise, I'll just move to the sort of closing question. So um, I, I think you can, you can add one more question before we close. Okay. So, all right. So, Ben, uh, you've emphasized the importance of human AI collaboration, particularly in initiatives you mentioned, OpenCog Hyperon, but also Sophiaverse. How do you envision AI systems working more seamlessly with humans? And what role does decentralized AI play in facilitating this collaboration? Um, how do we envision AIs working more seamlessly with humans? I mean, I mean, I, I think, I think, uh, honestly, the generative AI revolution has been fantastic for that, right? I mean, this is all about, hmm. all about, uh, AI tools that ordinary people can use in pretty simple and transparent ways to, to, to do practical stuff. And that's. That's, that's part true. of why these tools have taken off so much, right? Like anyone, I mean, anyone can use mid journey. Anyone can you can use chat GBT or, 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 or Claude. So, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, and that's been interesting to see because it's actually given me some optimism even beyond my previous optimism about the, uh, the potential for democratic governance as AI gets more advanced. Cause just watching how, like 80 year old ladies or fifth grade students react to chat GPT was fascinating because when it first came out, when GPT four first came out, people were like, Oh my God, like Terminator's here. The world, the world's going to end. It's so smart. And then after like a month or two of playing with it, I found most ordinary people got actually the correct practical sense of, Oh, this is really smart. It's also really annoying and comes up with a bunch of, of, BS and it can't really reason that well. And yes, it can write a poem in any genre, but they're all bad poems, right? So, I, I mean, I felt like when the thing is put in front of ordinary people, they stop going all, all, off the rails with a right. crazy Hollywood movie fueled speculations and they can actually understand what, what, what they're dealing with, right? So I, I think we're now in an era where AI is in everybody's hands and we're, we're in an era where people are gradually forming a more realistic idea about what AI is and how it will relate to people. And I think putting stuff in front of people that they can use is, is the, the key to that right now. If we go back to the decentralized ecosystem, though, to SingularityNet, NewNet, HyperCycle and, and, and so forth. I mean, you know, when I met Tufi, and talk to him and then Dan Tolliver about what they were doing in Toda. It was obvious they'd made a big breakthrough or a few couple breakthroughs in how decentralized networks could function in a more large scale, more fundamentally peer to peer way. Like Bitcoin was a breakthrough, the notion of smart contracts with a breakthrough and the way that Toda deals with a ledgerless peer, peer to peer blockchain networks is another breakthrough, but it was also clear, like what they had was hard to understand coming at, to it as an outsider. And certainly there was no easy way to use it and, and interact with it or, 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 or do anything with it unless, unless you were part of their inside group. And I, I'd say OpenCog, the, the AGI platform that I've been playing with for, for quite Did we lose Ben? Uh, seems like it. Hopefully he comes back. We 
weirdest connection exactly at 10 o'clock it dropped uh, yeah i mean pacific Going yeah exactly back, right so I, I think a major challenge a major challenge for the decentralized ecosystem going forward is to make stuff that's easy for the random programmer to use and if if we can make tools that are easy for the random programmer to use then a bunch of random programmers will make tools that are easy tools that are easy for the for the average average and and and, and user to use right so like it's it's easy to write a python script running on azure to to or, or aws to link together machine learning tools it's easy to go to hugging face and spin up instances of of, of ai models like we need to make it that easy for people to use tools running on decentralized infrastructure right. and then we'll have yeah. an army of of open source developers using our decentralized tools to make the next generation of, of ai AI application. So like, I mean, I, I tend to focus on backend and the inner AI algorithmics, but having, having a development community work on UI UX and APIs and, and usability is going to be equally yep. important. Yeah. That makes yeah I saw sense. my yeah. connection got screwed there, but I guess, I guess, uh, it's all being recorded. My ranch is being recorded locally. So it should, should, uh, right, should right, right. upload yeah. all right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Tufi. So uh, switching back to thinking about the, the decentralized networks picture here more broadly. So you have a longstanding vision and passion for decentralized AI governance uh, expressed in projects such as AI Decentralized, a Decentralized AI Alliance. You work with IEEE, uh, now HyperCycle. Uh, so how do you see decentralized networks influencing the scalability, efficiency, and collaborative potential of AI applications in a way you've sort of gestured towards and described, uh, but in ways that's beneficial to humanity as a whole? Because I know that's a big part of your vision. So I'd like to hear you speak about that. Absolutely. So uh, so imagine the world without us and the world with us. Okay. So without us, you just see, are we meaningful in what we're doing that's why we're trying to imagine it without us okay uh, without our existence is the world gonna get to agi there's maybe yes maybe no okay if it's no we're not going to talk about any opportunity or any problem the world is never gonna get to agi most intelligent people in ai they tell you that we are gonna get to agi so the question would be, when we say we, who is going to get to AGI? Because we know that there's a race towards AGI. And if you were to ask randomly, select 1,000 AI scientists, you're probably going to get different votes on who's going to get to AGI first. Some they tell you the Tencent, some they tell you Chinese government, some they tell you the Secret Service. So everybody tells you something. But the question that folks they need to ask, what happens when that central entity gets to AGI first? Can you ask this AGI at that point to make itself better? And how long does it take? So let's say the response is 10 days. It's going to get in 10 days. It can get 10 times better and it's going to cost you a billion dollars. You inject that. If you were to ask it that same question again, how long is it going to take you to get 10 times better? It's going to tell you probably five days because it's already 10 times better. How, how much is going to cost to save? Is that a billion, hundred billion? The point is you can keep asking that same question if you have that. AGI, um, and if you control it, and here's the thing, many AI scientists, they think if this thing is more intelligent than us, then it gets to decide on our behalf. Well, not necessarily. There's a lot of intelligent forces in the world. They don't get to decide what to do. There's other decision makers that they are way dumber than them. Okay. The decision can, is not necessarily yet in the hands of the intelligence It's on the way. But while it's being decided by that small group that you're betting on is getting to AGI first, that small group is capable of, of having something that is perhaps a trillion times more intelligent than all humanity combined in a very short period of time. Mm. And it controls it. So we're not talking about something that is like, you know, a thousand times more 
powerful than nuclear war weapons, or probably a billion times more powerful than nuclear war weapons. And, and it's in the hands of those few. And the, the capabilities that, you, that those can do what they think is ethical is not necessarily what you think is ethical. Or what they think is ethical today may not necessarily be that ethical tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the world without us. Which I'm hoping if that world without us, it's actually there's very mirrors of us that they're doing something if you don't exist. But now let's imagine the world with us because that's what we do know. What Ben and I have been tirelessly working on and a lot of amazing people in our, our organizations and joint forces and many times they disagree on a lot of things. But there's one thing that everybody agrees on is that if this world were to exist with our existence, the entire world will get to AGI first, not a single entity because the internet of AI is a lot more powerful than a single AI. We truly believe that that is the case, despite what many AI scientists currently disbelieve in our thing, but when they actually listen for an hour or two, they actually believe us. Mm. When they pay the attention, like I haven't really seen a single AI scientist who actually pays attention for an hour or two, who doesn't actually come and join forces. I haven't. And if you have, please bring them on. It's just fascinating that that the stuff that we're working on is, is, is you don't know that you're going to cross the street. You believe that you can cross the street. And here's the same thing. Do you believe that this is a better world, more likely? Well, if that's the case, then you probably want to partake mm -hmm. in its creation, in making it happen. Absolutely. Why is it a better world? Well, let me ask you this question. So a single entity controlling that thing that is a lot more powerful or... 8 billion lives controlling this thing that is a lot more powerful. Does that mean that every one of those 8 billion lives can launch those nuclear weapons? And absolutely not. That's not what decentralized yeah. governance is. Yeah. What this means is that it's like you use one of the weaknesses that we have in humanity that you can't have even 10 people to agree on the same thing to work to our benefit because they're not going to agree that let's wipe out all the people with long hair or with beards, you know, because they think that that's ethical. For example, you know, no, if they have both when long we, hair and beards, it's questionable. But what, yeah, what are the others? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so you, you see, so I, I truly, truly think for the future of our humanity, of all of our children, everybody that we, we, we strongly believe that that is uh, a safer world to live in with a much higher probability. We have not seen a single AI scientist who kind of refute that when we when they actually understand it, when they listen, when they cannot repeat what we're doing. If they just re-explain what we're doing, that means they get it. By simply doing that, they're pretty much on board. If they cannot explain what we're doing, that means they were not listening. So of course you gotta excuse them. <laughs> so so I think it's it's pretty powerful. We're super excited. We want to continue on that mission and we're 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 closer than ever. And we welcome a lot of supporters from across a lot of uh, disciplines in whether they are academics or not we truly need any help that we can get and we say it as humbly as it can be because we do need that help to get there amazing thank you Tufi. it's an exciting vision i think one that we can all get behind uh, see the value of um okay uh, so to bring this to a close uh i just want both of you to think a bit about the future, I mean, you thought a lot about this already, obviously. So your, your thoughts on the future of AI in society, and we're sort of leading into that discussion here. So uh, how do you think AI might shape societies globally in the future? So what positive impacts, challenges, and ethical considerations do you foresee as, as things move forward, as things continue to evolve with what AI can do? So give us a glimpse into your perspective on the broader societal implica implications of AI development and the potential role of AI in addressing global challenges? I mean, this is a funny question to ask uh, a singularitarian, right? Because I guess my, my, my view is that within the next, let's say three to 10 years, we're very likely to get to AI as smart as people. And I think mm -hmm. once you have an AI that can do AI development better than people, you're gonna rapidly see what IJ could call the intelligence explosion when you get to super intelligence, so w which pretty much means if the super intelligence likes you, okay, you know, you get some flavor of utopia, not that everything is perfect, but we'll, we'll have, we'll be on to a 
quite different set of problems than, than what we have now with uh, issues of material scarcity yeah. and de death, disease, and so forth. Will be will be uh, th 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 things of the past. Now, if the super intelligence doesn't like you so so, so well, then the out the outcome could be could be less desirable from our, from our current standpoint, right? So, I mean, if if you take this perspective, then you have the question of how do you engineer human level AGI so that the super intelligence it grows into will be beneficial with the, with reasonably high odds. And then you have the question of how to make the transitional period as broadly beneficial as, as possible, right? Like the period, mm -hmm. if it is three to 10 years, what happens in those three to 10 years, what happens in the developing world in those three to 10 years as, right. as AI has become more and more capable and start, start dominating more of the economy and, and so forth. And I think both of these are worthy things to think about. Well, even choosing immediate practical projects to, 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 to work on, right? So, I mean, if you think about, say, you know, automated code development, I mean, making this work beyond this sort of repetitive template level of coding, this directly works toward, you know, self-modifying, self-improving AI and, and the singularity, because ultimately it's going to be code rewriting code that, get, that gets us there. On the other hand, you can look at a project like speech to speech translation for under-resourced African languages or something, right? And here, here you have a use of current AI technology, which directly can help smooth out the transition in the, in the, in the developing world. So, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think uh, there's, there's a lot of things we can do with AI now, right? W w one thing is make a startup that makes money by me by meeting the needs of the mainstream, let's say, US or Western European consumer. Another thing is do things that palpably work towards super intelligence. Another thing is doing things that, that help smooth out the transition to the AGI phase for, for the, the less fortunate on, on the planet, right? And the, the good news is, you know, we can work on all the all these different things because, because AI AI has has so, so much so much potential now, and all these different things should 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 be done, and we have free choice regarding which of these things we want to hack on, right? So it's a, it's an amazing time we live in. Very cool. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Tufi. You're saying you know I I just hope that there's a lot of the the current. Uh, Unfortunate problems that I still see in the world. We're living in 2023, and I still see that there's a lot of misalignments, a lot of uh, uh, poverty, a lot of uh, you know medical care is not getting to people, whatnot. But yet, at the same time, I know what uh, technology is capable of, and uh, and and you know I, I don't want to like uh, point finger fingers and point it at those that they keep slowing down the progress of technology because they fear its outcome because they don't understand it. But instead, I just ask folks that. If you don't understand something, you don't really need to have to fear it. You just need to perhaps like learn it more and embrace it because it is there that can help tremendous amount of people. The vast majority of people, they're not living, uh, you know, comfortably in this world. If you travel around, you, you get to see that in, you, in your own eyes. And But yet technology is capable. Right now, we're living in a time that if you were to ask any technologists, are we capable to build, let's say, a city that is fully self-sustaining by, by, by technological elements without having any human whatsoever that can actually feed people and whatnot. Is that possible? Today, if you ask any, if you go to any computer science school and ask them, is that possible? And they can probably put that model for you. It is possible today. So it's not that rocket science. Okay. But yet we're not doing it. So there's a lot of things that we're not doing. And just because there's a lot of like uh, pushback from a lot of the folks that they don't understand certain elements of technology that they keep pushing back they want to slow down the progress of ai i'm like whoa whoa, whoa what you want to s like it, it's like imagine you know you're you, you're pregnant you're about to have a baby and then you're like whoa whoa, whoa i'm gonna slow you down i, I don't want that baby to, it's not healthy okay like we, we really need to keep going we are marching us as humanity we're having that beautiful baby so let's just if, you, if folks don't understand it, they just have to learn it more. 
not fear it and block it and slow it down because it can service a tremendous amount of people as we're getting to what the ultimate dream that you know Ben is referring to that we can get to and enjoy that thing that can outlive us and can be a lot smarter than us. Yeah, you know, contributing all to the positive vision of what the possibilities are here, doing it in a secure way as possible, uh, you know, using it to help people and help help AI develop in a way that you know works with humans, all these things and and sharing in a you know, like I say, a positive vision of what's possible rather than being afraid of what the implications are, it seems to be. Right. Coming from both of you. Right. Big thanks to our awesome panel. Your insights and perspectives were top notch, and we appreciate the lively discussion. We hope to have you again next year. Hi, everyone. So we've got a ton of exciting stuff lined up for you today. We have the site stages and recruitment sessions. We also have open expert network and tech workshops, as well as ecosystem partner workshops. We have some more keynotes and product demos. Okay, so thank you, Haley, um, and thank you to Open Mesh for the invite to speak. Very uh, grateful. Um, lots of wonderful speakers um, in the lineup, so I'm very humbled to be here. So thank you again for for inviting me. Uh, my name's Tim Lee, and I'm going to be looking at some of the commercial aspects relating to how the blockchain and artificial intelligence are coming together because obviously artificial intelligence is mushrooming at the moment and we just need to see where the two can overlap. So first of all, I mean, why listen to me? Fundamentally, don't, because I'm just as flawed as you are. And um, other than that, I've written a book on the blockchain, 20 years in corporate finance, advising a lot of clients, working with some IoT and AI and blockchain-based clients right now. And some of that experience I'll bring into the discussions to try and help uh, sort of enlighten you on some of the areas that I'm seeing in relation to blockchain and AI coming together. So I guess the first thing is, it's really what is the power of AI? And I mean, I mean, as we as we know, um, I mean, the data is uh, is is the fundamental of, of AI, and very much AI allows pattern recognition to actually happen at a great degree. And for example, I'm working with a um, a client called Spen Console that does. Uh, they do things linked in to supplier invoices at enterprise level, nothing particularly exciting. But what is exciting is that they've implemented AI linked into optical character recognition. So they've trained about a million documents to actually pick up data from supplier-based invoices. So that pattern recognition is becoming is very, very powerful. And for their clients, that actually means that there's a massive automation of data. And that becomes very, very powerful. Equally, with AI, I mean, the data actually trains itself with machine learning, and that becomes, again, increasingly powerful um, in that the, you know, the data begins to train itself and the model's enhanced. Um, natural language processing, as we know, with the likes of ChatGPT, with human-like interaction, and extracting information from documents, massive time-saving. I mean, I've been an active user of ChatGPT for about nine months now. Uh, it is flawed. It is flawed, but it actually presents some great productivity tools, which is amazing. Um, one of the other key things clearly is decision making and optimization in terms of whenever there's a massive quantum of data, it's, it's, it's incredibly complex to process. So AI undertakes a lot of that analysis far, far quicker than we could ever hope to do. And we've got the, the scalability and automation. You know, for example, when there are repetitive tasks, those are uh, actively being pursued at a deep level using AI chatbots and being working within the fintech space. And banks currently are actively upgrading their AI chatbots to look at the lower level decision making um, to go on. And what that means is we're beginning to see the beginning of a trend of um, insourcing the outsourcing. So what that means is where historically we've perhaps outsourced to India or the Philippines from a cost basis, because the lower level skills can be done by technology, that's actually meaning that outsourcing is being insourced. And certainly Spend Console, who are working at that enterprise level, are seeing that, that trend happening right now. So 
when we look at um, AI overall, what we have to understand is right now is the worst from a performance point of view that AI will be. And it's only going to get exponentially better from here. So given it's the worst that we're ever going to be, we've got to try and project forward where things are going to go. And the power of the chips that power the machine learning models that are behind the AI are where a massive battle's going on at the moment. I mean, NVIDIA are the massive market leaders globally. And there's a massive shortage of chips at the moment going on. So Google, um, have, they are launching new chips that are up to 1.7 times faster than NVIDIA. Um, you've also got AMD. They've got some new chips coming out, which are supposed to be even faster. And I've been working with a, um, a decentralized uh, player that's bringing together underutilized GPUs from Bitcoin miners. Uh, to actually bring those together. That's a company called Antbit that is now called um, io.net. So they, you know, they're using underutilized GPUs. So you know, the, the AI overall is just going to grow exponentially. Now, of course, most of us know already about the power of the blockchain, bearing in mind this is a, a primary focus on, on blockchain. Digital ownership, absolutely um, incredibly powerful especially with sort of NFTs, for example, as an, an immutable record. Uh, I am the co-founder of a social impact project called Walking Between Worlds that launched the world's first algorithmic collection of genuine indigenous artists. Um, the programmability of funds with smart contracts, as we know, again, um, that, you know, I, I don't want to preach, um, preach to the converted, but obviously we can program funds against specific actions. And then the key thing is the, the Internet of Value. And this is the key thing that, that I see is, is one of the, the core elements of the power of the blockchain. I spent 20 years working in corporate finance with people like GE Capital, HSBC, Lloyds Bank, those sorts of guys. And the banking system is just so antiquated, especially when it comes to international transactions. When you try and transfer money from the US to here, it can take up to two weeks, um, two weeks to transfer funds, which is insane. And then we've got CBDCs. Now, this is an area that I think is going to be a massive time bomb uh, when it comes to AI, because governments can actually control the economy in real time. And one of the key things that one looks at when it comes to that is the, the different interest rates that are available for different demographics. So for example, with boomers that may have a lot of cash, they can actually fine tune negative interest rates for the boomers and look at a positive 5% interest, for example, for Zoomers. So to encourage Zoomers to save and to encourage boomers to spend. And this is just the beginning of CBDCs. Currently, it is 98% of the world's GDP is actually um, testing CBDCs. So let's look at the weaknesses of AI because I think it's important because I think this is where the blockchain can actually help. Now, one of the key things is that anything to do with AI is based around data models that have been created, like ChatGPT, for example, is based on data for, uh, up until September 2021, some in, into January 2022. But those data models become self-reinforcing. If there are biases, for example, that are in that internet-based data, the AI is going to have that same bias. Um, equally, you know, the trained data that um, a lot of companies are trying to create um, become these sort of black boxes. And certainly in discussions with a number of VCs over the past six to nine months, a lot of VCs want to see proprietary data which gives them value. Now, of course, we can, when we look at AI, there's always the talk of Skynet and state bad actors. I mean, I don't propose to get too heavily into that other than you know, if we've actually got the ability to um, to automate particular structures, bad actors are going to take, uh, take control. The biggest weakness, I think, is going to be the loss of privacy. Because the more powerful the AI is, the more that they can work together. Cameras linking into ID, linking to bank accounts, linking to CBDCs. It's going to be an absolute nightmare. 
equally, we're getting deep fakes and manipulation happening all the time as it stands at the moment. I mean, you know, AI is generating fake content. We've got um, cloned audio that can literally take somebody's voice and recreate that over a number of, you know, just by having a few seconds worth of audio. And that is actively being used to scam and to defraud, so much so that the, the banks that I've in, been in discussions with are actually changing some of their security policies linked into audio um, security control. And there's a lack of um, accountability and control. Mass, you know, the more we become dependent on AI, the more we're going to have problems if, it's, uh, if we have bad actors coming through. So looking at the two together, where can we see the power? I guess the, the key thing is that blockchain, because it provides that immutable record, can confirm that AI models have not been tampered with. Now, I think one of the things that's really important linking into that is identity. Twitter actually had a really good idea when they were looking at the hexagonal around NFTs to confirm your particular identity. They seem to have moved away from that particular side of things. But identity is going to be absolutely critical. And I think the immutable records associated with blockchain are going to be a fundamental that's going to be linked into that. The sharing of private data is going to be massive, with a personal data economy really starting to move, where data owners can share their own data uh, with AI models without revealing personally identifiable information, PII as it's called. Um, this also yeah, equals uh, yeah, the transparency and trustworthiness so that you know, one can actually be sure that the, that the AI model is actually transparent and it's a tamper-proof you know, tamper record. Of course, if you go through every single decision, it's going to be very resource-hungry when it comes to, to blockchain-based um, structures. I think we're probably going to see decentralized autonomous organizations work together with AI to enable more effective, complex decisioning to be, to be seen. Um, and also, you know, when it comes to looking at sort of smart contracts, AI is going to enhance the, um, you know, to, to enhance more complex smart contracts to automate funding against particular decisions. We're going to have decentralized AI marketplaces that are also going to come through with data monetization and, and a whole variety of different areas where you can actually sell your data for a, for a fair and reasonable portion. On the positive side at enterprise level, I see that we're going to see things like supply chain and provenance coming together with AI. So that the blockchain already looks at the authenticity and provenance of goods in a supply chain. AI can enhance that by looking, for example, at predicting supply chain disruptions that might be through floods or typhoons, whatever it might be. So those coming together are going to be a very positive um, boon. My big concern, however, is CBDCs. I think that we're going to see privacy being a thing of the past. I mean, CBDCs, most are being driven by blockchain-based technologies. And when you've got AI linked to digital currencies, I mean, we're already seeing this, for example, in China, where if you cross the street illegally, AI facially recognizes who you are, links it into your social score, and you then and links it into you personally, and you get a fine in the post. That's the way things are going to go. And if CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies, are going to be linked to your personal data, your income data, and your health data, it's going to become a real nightmare. So just watch out for the pushback on privacy. So overall, just in conclusion then, AI is very powerful, but it's dangerous if unchecked. And that's one of the, the key things. The blockchain can support the appropriate use of AI. There's no question about it in terms of the immutable record, especially when it comes to identity. And I think CBDCs are going to change everything in this whole landscape of AI and blockchain coming together. So really, on balance, I think you know, blockchain can certainly help artificial intelligence. But I'm sure it's going to open up a debate relating to privacy and that type of thing. So I'm very happy to uh, I think I'm going to be in one of the, the rooms directly after this talk if you want to come and have a further chat. Uh, but in the, in the interim, I'd like to thank uh, OpenMesh and the team for inviting me. And uh, uh, any questions, please feel to reach out and speak to you soon. Thanks a lot. We're in the home stretch of OpenDI, and we can't waste a minute. The next speaker fits the shared vision of the conference and the belief that we can change the current flawed systems. 
Let's throw a virtual high five and welcome our next speaker to the stage. Terrific. So uh, thanks for having me at the Open Infrastructure and Open Data event. What I thought I would do is quickly talk about why I believe that acceleration ethics is the is a natural ethics for uh, this community and this way of working in the technological space. So the title of my presentation is Acceleration is the Right Ethics for Web3. And what I will do is I'll first just talk very briefly about what acceleration ethics is. And then I will give uh, two examples to show how I believe that it fits almost organically uh, with open data and open infrastructure. So uh, let's go. Uh, first, uh, so the problem that inevitably, one problem that inevitably arises around technology is that almost every solution we have, almost everything we do which solves a problem, also gives rise to some subsequent new problem. Uh, and the question is, well, how do we manage these problems which AI innovation or technological innovation is, is producing? And there are two general responses. Uh, one is the so-called slow AI movement, uh, which seeks to solve these problems by minimizing their um, existence uh, by having to some extent, less artificial intelligence innovation or less technological innovation. Uh, the idea being that if we move more slowly uh, and not so ambitiously, the kinds of problems that arise will be fewer and more easily managed. That's that's one possibility. Uh, by contrast, the possibility that, that I am going to advocate here is the acceleration possibility. And this approach starts with the idea that the best way to solve the kinds of problems that technological innovation creates uh, is with more innovation. So in a certain sense, innovation solves innovation's own problems. And that general approach is called acceleration ethics. And that's what I'm going to talk about today uh, briefly. These are the five elements that are normally attributed to acceleration ethics. Uh, the first is an overall approach. I've already begun to talk about that, the idea that innovation solves innovation problems. Uh, then there, there is the idea that innovation is intrinsically valuable, the idea that the uncertainty in what is unknown is magnetic or attractive. Uh, there is the idea that ethics should be embedded in technological processes. And there's the idea that ethics should be decentralized. We have limited time today, so I thought I would just look quickly at the first and the last as a way of getting, giving a kind of example of, or a sense of the way that acceleration ethics works. So we'll just look at those two. And I think we'll look at just one example from, 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 from each of them. Uh, so the first subject we're going to, or the first element of acceleration ethics that we're going to talk about is uh, this idea that innovation solves innovation problems. And, the example I have here is this question of digital digital red line. That is uh, the idea that to begin with, we prefer we we hope that uh, lending and finance and banking kind of services are distributed with equal opportunities across the population. Uh, however, there are racial, gender, and other kinds of discrimination. Uh, that have been historically cooked into the kind of data uh, that banks and other lending institutions use when they decide things like loans. And a problem that we have with artificial intelligence is the technology in general, when it's used as a tool to help us decide who does and who does not get loans, a problem we have is that sometimes those discriminatory traits get incorporated into the data through proxies, through things like the zip code where someone lives. And the result is that certain groups um, end up being adversely affected or discriminated against when it comes to loan technology. So 
the basic situation is the following. If on the surface, it looks like technology is in a sense better than human beings to decide who should get loads and who should not, because obviously a technology is not going to be in itself, in and of itself, racist or sexist or what have you. Uh, but as I say, what actually happens when you put this technology to work is that it learns from data that itself has been constructed on, at least to some extent, and in some occasions, not always, not everywhere, but sometimes and in some places, on uh, foundations which are discriminatory. So at the end, the AI produces discriminatory outcomes when it comes to you know, lending and other financial services. And so going back to our original distinction, there are two ways to solve this problem. One is we can limit the power of the artificial intelligence. This is the so-called slow AI movement. What we try and do here is we say, look, uh, we need to make sure that we understand why and how the AI makes its lending decisions so that we can screen out the discriminatory outcomes. And of course, this is a positive solution, but I don't think that it necessarily works better than the other solution, which is to say, instead of simplifying the artificial intelligence and instead of uh, limiting its use, we should go the other way and we should let innovation try to solve this problem uh, of discrimination. And one way it could do that, in one way that fits very well with open infrastructure and open data communities, is by allowing wide access to the kinds of technology which des which decides where loans go and wide access to the data with the idea that new companies, say uh, um, decentralized finance companies or uh, cryptocurrency kinds of companies, very agile technology, technologically oriented kinds of companies uh, can take this data and develop new ways of locating good credit risks in underserved communities. So instead of saying we're going to slow down the artificial intelligence and have less technology, now what we say is we're going to have more data, more open infrastructure, more technology, and we're going to use this to go in and again to find within generally underserved communities those risks which are good and those opportunities to lend within a kind of conventional structure that is lending for profit, uh, but lending to communities which have been overlooked in the past. So that's one example of what acceleration looks like. Um, when we have the, the fundamental problem, we all agree it's a problem, uh, that sometimes techno technological decisions about loans lead to discriminatory outcomes. Uh, we say that instead of slowing down the technology, making it more transparent and therefore less accurate, uh, we go the other way. We say, let's make the technology more accurate. Let's hype or uh, drive the technology further in order to use these, develop new tools to find good credit risks. So that's a little bit more in-depth look at what it means to say that innovation solves innovation's problems. Right? So innovation begins, it creates this problem, but it doesn't create the problem, but it perpetuates it, the problem of discrimination and lending, and then more innovation can solve the problem. All right, so that's that's one example of what acceleration ethics looks like. And it's one case where I think this kind of ethics fits your open data and open infrastructure communities better than the other option, which is the slow AI movement. Then we'll quickly jump ahead to a, a second example. Uh, and this is the idea of decentralization in ethics. So this is the fifth element. The idea that innovation solves innovation problems is the first element of acceleration ethics. This is the fifth element. Uh, and what I want to say here is that the idea of decentralization itself uh, solves important contemporary problems. So just in the news, uh, I've been watching now, just in these last few days, the trial of the, the name of this specific character in this case, but the exchange was FTX and he was a criminal and he was it's just stealing money left and right from all these different exchanges. Um, this is obviously a problem when financial institutions, uh, in this case, a cryptocurrency exchange, this is obviously a problem when financial institutions are stealing money from their clients. Again, here, there are two kinds of solutions. Uh, one, we could look for more centralization. 
This would be more government laws and regulation. This would be greater government oversight. And of course, these kinds of sol solutions have merit and, and they respond to a real problem. But acceleration ethics goes the other way. Acceleration ethics is the idea that we would use decentralized techniques to, in a certain sense, regulate or control uh, the kinds of things that happen in the world. So as opposed to a centralized regulator like the government, uh, we want to aim for decentralized regulation as would be provided by users themselves, for example. Uh, we might see this in generative artificial intelligence and uh, users' responses to the kinds of images that are produced or the kinds of texts that are produced by the recent generative technology. Uh, but here in this example, what we're thinking of would be a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange obviously has the advantage uh, that everyone can see where the money is coming from and going to. And so you're not going to have this kind of secret slippage or this kind of secret um, uh, splicing out of some amount of money as we saw in the FTX exchange. So the idea of decentralization and again, open data, open infrastructure uh, is the idea that within ethics, we better regulate, or in a sense, we better control the direction and the humanist uses of our technology by letting users themselves participate in the decisions about where money goes and where money doesn't go. So that's a second example of the way acceleration ethics works. Uh, in a world in which we all agree that there are people trying to do bad things, the kinds of controls or guidelines uh, that we build in order to limit these bad things come from decentralized authorities. They come from users more than government. They come from what is actually happening and the way people are spending or moving their money within a network as opposed to a set of rules which precede the network and try to preempt wrongdoing. So that's the difference between centralization in regulation and in ethics and decentralization. And as I say, the idea is that acceleration ethics participates in decentralization. So that's just a quick example of uh, why I believe that acceleration ethics works better for the community of people who are here gathered at this event. And I've given two fairly brief examples of two elements of acceleration ethics. There are other elements and a fuller picture that I would be happy to give if you would like to talk later. In any case, uh, thanks for joining us in this brief presentation. A huge shout out to our speaker. That was one of the best talks I've seen and we've all learned so much. Thanks again. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Charles, the founder of Swan Network. So Swan Network is a layer two decentralized cloud computing solution. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be here to discuss about the future of decentralized computing. So the first question is like, uh, what is decentralized computing and why we need decentralized computing? So we see that the entire global cloud computing market uh, can be a billion dollar business, um, um, even trillion dollar business in a couple of years. And uh, we can see the market is still like uh, largely taken by centralized computing providers like AWS, Microsoft, Google. Um, but we see like uh, they still trying to grab about 30% of the um, blockchain computing as well. Um, but still there's a two thirds of computing power still uh, on other providers. On the other side is from an, another market is about the age data center market. Few people notice that on the other side, the data center is also increasing. Uh, for the place I stay, uh, uh, that's the one we are in Montreal. So there are over 40 data centers in Montreal. And in US, data center is also increasing rapidly as a, a yearly increasing about 18% and global wise, it can be a um, $30 billion business. 
So basically, like you can see, like uh, uh, there was a huge demand increasing in the computing power and huge locations of providers. And with the latest uh, involving of the AI and the um, and the computing side, we see like uh, there's lots of AI compile computing power needs. Everybody is uh, chasing bigger companies, small companies, AI training companies that pursuing more and more computing power for different models. So we can see like every four, three to four months is doubling their needs in the AI. So with three slides together, you will see like we have a basic conclusion. Uh, the car computing power is still like uh, largely dominated by the central computing providers. There are lots of data centers actually not really in the group and that they are rapidly growing. And on the third side, the demand of AI is rapidly growing. So the question in front of us like, is how can we put the resource together? If we can connect all those data centers with something can provide same quality or even more power computing as a central cloud. Can we building an even and a more economic market use those power existing in the data center? That's what we are talking about today, decentralized computing with one network. So with the past few years, we spend a lot of research uh, we divide service on different categories as a storage, payment, age computing, and the seeding access. What you exactly need is get them connected and provide applications for any user. There are a couple of use cases will be good for the purpose of digital computing. For example, you can run in data analytics. If you have the data and the computing power in the same data center, it won't be a problem about the latency. You can just go there, training your model. And if you have some data centers have lots of GPUs, then you can run the stable diffusion as a container base, similar to the Hugging Face and the other provider. And if you want to generate the AI computing with music, you can use music generation models, which provided by Meta, previously Facebook. You can even run in some game like um, Super Mario, uh, et cetera, and some age gaming on the distributed node. But all of this requires a large connection of different data centers. We have tried to last month with the first trail, connect over 200 storage providers worldwide. They are in different data centers. We have transferred 200 pedal data from one data center to another data center to building the data center data migration. We also have tested with about 9,000 applications has been deployed on the worldwide data center network. Can the data center can be from different regions, from US, from Canada, from Finland, from even Ukraine. And they are in the 15 cities. The advantage of decentralized computing is not just like we can provide some technology and user experience or just cheaper. The reason of decentralization is great is you can deliver to the region and fit their needs in each region. For example, if you want to do some GDPR in Europe, right? So with centralized company, you have lots of issues because your data is actually transferred back, even though you claim you're not, but actually in some cases, it's still transfer some data back to the central governance team or head the offices, then you maybe have a compliance issue. Imagine when you're running the decentralized cloud computing infra. Those infra, you can have regional center, which is self-governance, DAO organization, uh, DAO, DAO, organize those management. What you need to do is just running the software, join together as a small DAO organization to manage each system. We have a building the DOS structure and which can be used since next month and you can do in self-governance. So that is one way to make sure your compliance with each regions and still running a robust network. There's lots of technologies involved in the system to make it happen. Uh, on our side, one cool thing is about the data storage. 
right? Instead of using AWS3 hosting their own infra, we are using the IPFS uh, come, come with the Firecoin archive node as the temporal storage on distributed worldwide node. If even some data is lost or destroyed due to every reason, you can still fetch the data back and you can rebuild the system from the archive, from network. Uh, we're working with the Chainlink CCIP, and the CCIP give you a robust message parsing, so you can parsing the demands from one network to, an, to another network. Those demands across chain enable you to use the multi-chain computing power from different duplex locations worldwide. We have been working on this for three years. Uh, in the beginning, the first product we deliver is the multi storage because without IPFS and the decentralized storage, you cannot really achieve decentralized computing. Then in order to keep to make sure the copyright everything in one place, we're doing the data NFT. Uh, with the chaining cross-chain technology, you will be able to reserve your copyright and licensing to different chains um, with the original copy together. And the decentralized computing, we're building the computing provider based on EVM technology, so you can run it as a smart contract with a payment and the other economic model to make sure that you get the payment. And um, now we are working on the Q4, we are working on building a test net. It's a Ethereum layer two, so all the EVM compatible machines can, using the facility, for example, Polygon, BSC, or whatever, you can benefit from the layer two infra and uh, we are going to do the DAO uh, governance next year, Q2, about the main and launch. With sub self management DAO worldwide, we can building a decentralized network. Yeah, this program has been like uh, awarded by different uh, parties, entities like uh, Binance Labs, Firecoin, Chainlink, uh, um, and the outer layer venture. And we also participate in the Microsoft Startup Hub and also Good Go cloud program. Yeah, uh, there are lots of strong backers from Pro Labs, Binance Labs, and the other investors help us make it happen, thanks to them. And if you are interested about product, you can check out our um, website and uh, follow our uh, GitHub or Discord Twitter uh, for everything. And uh, at the end, I'm going to give a small demo about uh, how it looks like a decentralized computing. Yeah, so this is one of the product uh, we call the log launch. So it's a decentralized cloud computing network. So uh, this is a typical stable diffusion. It's uh, running on a third party. You can see like it's from MBFS data, this provider. If we want to check the information, we can see like uh, the this is all the data space card. You can see how to using it. And uh, those are the IPFS hosting all the files and the data. And uh, with the app, you can you be able to see the UI in order to let let's running generate uh, image. For example, you can just uh, put the pump here and uh, the negative pump here, and you can generate it's using the thirty eight GPUs, and uh, this is the image generated and you can save it and then you can download it if you want to know more about the information about the servers you can see the details here they give you very clear about where the data stored and uh, who is is the winning leader computing provider and uh, there are three providers available uh, to make sure there's enough redundancy if the one of those are not available you can use another one and all of them are from different providers. You can know, understand, get the information from it from the URL link. And uh, for the general map of connections, you can see the status of the provider worldwide. This is a real time um, web to see like uh, how many GPUs are using, how many storage and memory is available on the network. And you can see like the providers. Uh, who provide the computing power with you and uh, their information and uh, their GPUs and their facilities, etc. 
Yes. So the other program you can, if you're interested, you can play with it. Just go here to see the space of different cans. And if you are interested to know more about the use case, the other use case scenarios you can find here. Yeah, with the artificial tools, gaming, blockchain, etc. Yeah. Thanks everyone. If you're interested, just contact us and we can work in together. Thank you. Bye. As decentralized finance grows, so does the number of exchanges on which blockchain-based assets can be traded. Decentralized exchanges, or DEXs, are seeing more and more adoption as the community trends towards trustless solutions in light of a string of centralized sources of fraud throughout the crypto ecosystem in recent years. In alignment with the philosophy of blockchains, DEXs address this issue by providing platforms that are resilient to manipulation by malicious insiders via distributed systems, algorithmic market making, open source code review, and the Darwinian selection of trustworthy and useful tools by the free market. A DEX aggregator is a service that brings liquidity pools from multiple DEXs together in one platform and is generally packaged with some sort of uh, smart order routing or SOR. These aggregators can be compared analogously with services from other industries such as Google Flights or DIG. However, much like many aggregators in other industries, DEX aggregators are generally not agnostic and have built-in biases that reward certain parties involved. This often takes the form of routing orders through liquidity pools, which have reward schemes set up in favor of the protocol doing the routing, or via agreements with DEXs who wish to have more volume through their pools, which is proportional to revenue from fees. EdaX is an open source initiative to build an agnostic DEX aggregator and price discovery engine. It has been designed from first principles to be universal, scalable, and unbiased via an adaptable method of reverse engineering the conservation functions employed in the uh, automated market maker or AMM algorithms of DEX liquidity pools. EdX will always provide the best possible routes as calculated by reverse engineering publicly available smart contracts and their respective AMM conservation functions. EdX has three main ways of interacting with the data it's collected and the services it provides. The first of these is EdX Basic, a smart order router interface which lets users enter two tokens and a desired sell amount. Multiple routes are then suggested with estimated returns on each. The service does not provide any trade execution, uh, rather it focuses on data analysis and aggregation. So entering an example trade here, we can uh, look to swap 100 wrapped Ethereum for uh, an equivalent amount of DAI. Hitting this, we're then fetching the best price. And we can see we're shown a graph with possible routes with a top three best routes uh, side panel here. Then scrolling down, uh, we can see a table with all the detailed routes and clicking on each shows exactly what trade should be performed as well as some expected returns and price impact. Now moving on, EdX Pro is an API that provides a service similar to EdX Basic, uh, where users can query for optimal trade routes for their tokens. Now this service is more suited for professional, uh, for professional use cases, where many different token swaps may need to be queried programmatically or in bulk. Finally, EdX Analytics is a dashboard highlighting some aggregated stats of various liquidity pools throughout uh, DeFi. It's suited towards users who want a quick snapshot of the state of DeFi in order to gain insights into the current market dynamics and possibly make future predictions. So under the hood, uh, EdX relies on subgraphs provided by the Graph, an indexing protocol for querying blockchain networks, in this case, Ethereum. Various protocols develop and host so-called subgraphs, uh, protocol-specific APIs, which provide statistics and, and details for on-chain events and protocol metrics. This data is collected and stored into a bi-directional network graph of relevant liquidity pools and other state stores, where each node in the graph represents a pool. Each pool is then connected to any other pool with one or more assets in common. For example, a DAI USDC pool would connect to a DAI ETH pool, but not an ETH UNI pool. Traversing this graph with a pathfinding algorithm then determines suitable routes for tokens to pass through. Statistics for each route, as shown before, such as price impact and expected return and so on, are then calculated and displayed for the user. EdX aims to make DeFi data aggregation and price optimization efficient, transparent, and unbiased, empowering users to make data-driven decisions in how they interact with DeFi and trade their assets.
We're thrilled to present yet another insightful talk by another bright mind in the industry. This subject matter expert is here to review a wide range of topics from the current landscape of technology to the future trends shaping our digital world. Join us as we explore different perspectives, share insights, and delve deep into nuances of our ecosystem. Without further ado, let's give a warm virtual welcome to our next speaker. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining and welcome to this presentation on SingularityNet and our journey to artificial general intelligence and the role of blockchain layer three, the internet of knowledge in that journey. My name is Jan Horlings. I'm CPO at SingularityNet and it's my privilege to guide you through this presentation. So first, a few words on SingularityNet itself. Um, it's our mission, not just to create artificial general intelligence, but to create it in a decentralized, accessible way, make it that way, make it um, inclusive and democratic and thereby beneficial for everybody and the world as such. So we couldn't be more ambitious than that, but Luckily, we don't have to do it all alone. We created a whole ecosystem of organizations around us. And I can't go into each of them, um, but let me show you on the next slide um, that they are positioned uh, around different verticals. So you see here the logos of these organizations and uh, some of them are targeted at large enterprises. And, some of them are targeted at health tech or DeFi or uh, media and gaming or arts and entertainment and music. Um, and all of these uh, organizations are centered around our platform, our decentralized AI platform. And the idea about that platform is that anybody can put you anybody here can put their AI service on our platform with the goal that all other people everywhere um, can have access to that AI service. Now, imagine that at some point we'll have 50,000 services on that platform. Um, it's not just one on one links anymore, but we have a layer on top of it, which we call AI DSL. It stands for AI decent, uh, domain specific language. And it's an organ orchestration engine and an AI in itself. And AI DSL will orchestrate all these services. So when you have a complex task that cannot be executed by any one service on the platform, then AI DSL will search for you the best fitting services, create a workflow out of them so that your more complex task can be created. And it does all of that on the fly ad hoc. So that way we are combining all these smaller AI services in one bigger AI service. But the biggest AI service on the platform uh, will be OpenCog Hyperon or a version, an iteration of OpenCog Hyperon because OpenCog Hyperon is our framework for uh, artificial general intelligence. And I'll tell a little bit more about OpenCog Hyperon in the next frames, but first let me scale down, uh, go down to, to the bottom uh, where you see our technology stack that is underpinning uh, the platform. So what you see here is that uh, the platform is or will be um, uh, multi-blockchain. You see Cardano and Ethereum. You should also see HyperCycle. Maybe you don't know it yet. It's our next-gen uh, blockchain initiative, um, which is specifically developed for AI and creating uh, many uh, fast AI to AI transactions that will be needed when all these services are going to talk to each other on our platform. And below that, you see a new net for decentralized computing. Um, I use the word decentralization a lot, but 
if everything is decentralized, but we're still being hosted on Amazon or Google or Microsoft, then the whole system is not really decentralized. So that is where NewNet comes in and UNet offers decentralized computing from all kinds of data services and uh, and, and laptops and wallets and uh, mobile phones, etc. And always make sure that the best combination is used for the best, most fitting task or the most fitting hardware for the task at hand. And finally, we are also working even on our AI optimized board to make that whole vertical of uh, enabling technologies complete. So let me tell you a little bit more about our main framework, OpenCog Hyperon. So these days you hear a lot about AI and most of it is about large language models. And impressive as they are, we think that they have some inherited or in, in, in ingrained limitations. And we, we can talk a little bit more about that, but for time's sake, I will leave it at that. So we believe that by augmenting large language models and combining them with other methodologies, we'll have a much stronger human level and beyond intelligence, or at least the option to create that. So think about other strategies like um, what we call economic attention allocation or probabilistic networks or evolutionary methods of creating AI, and there are more of them. And imagine that you could not develop each of them in parallel, but let them work together. Uh, similar, like our brain is consisting of different methods and mechanisms that at some point work together and create an output. Now to drive that analogy with our brain a little bit further, in our brain, we also have different strategies for memories. We have long-term and short-term, and there are all kinds of different, uh, different kinds of mem uh, memories like sensory and motoric, but also declarative and, and episodic, uh, my, my life story and, and procedural, et cetera. Um, and we mimic that in a way, if you want to say, uh, in our uh, distributed atom space. We sometimes refer to DAS uh, as a metagraph. So it's a structure of multiple uh, knowledge graphs, but it could also have different containers like uh, large language models or other data containers being connected to it. So it's a very strong and versatile um, layer of data that is then turned into information and knowledge by all the metadata and all the interrelations uh, there are. Also enabling symbolic representations of uh, reality as we perceive it. And all of this um, would not be possible uh, without the glue that puts everything together, which is Meta. And Meta is our in-house developed uh, programming language, a very low level uh, um, abstract programming language. It is very deeply ingrained in distributed atom space and basically stored in distributed atom space. And Meta allows all these AI strategies to do their thing in the way they do it and store, but also adapt and change data on the data layer and that way turning data into knowledge and continually improving itself. So going from this vision, which is partly a reality already, um, it's based on open cock, which has been a reality for 10, 15 years. Um, but open cock hyperon is the next iteration of this, which is created for decentralization and for scalability and for better usability. Um, and we expect a lot of it, um, especially next health year when our new alpha of the whole system will be released. But in the meantime, while we're doing all that work, we are also working on what we call uh, blockchain layer three, uh, the knowledge uh, uh, layer of, uh, of internet. And we can already on our platform create all these knowledge graphs and create LLMs also and allow them to work together to already create the next step 
in AI. And anybody can do that. You can create a knowledge layer on our platform, or you can use one of the knowledge graphs, sorry, there are on our platform. So if we have these knowledge graphs, and we will have a number of LLMs that is also accessible on our platform, and we will uh, uh, offer some tooling, um, then we can already create um, uh, neurosymbolic enhanced LLMs or LLMs that benefit at the first stage from more up-to-date or domain-specific knowledge that is not stored in the LLM itself, but in the knowledge graph. And this is what we call our uh, blockchain layer three, the knowledge uh, layer of internet. And we invite everybody to join this and to come and offer your data there so that it can be used by everybody. And so that we create this foundation that is necessary for the next step of building our AI, even though neurocognitive uh, AI is not that data hungry as LLMs are these days, it will still benefit from uh, large and, and distributed, diversified uh, data set. So to show you how this looks in a diagram, uh, here at the bottom left, you see what, what I was explaining just now. We, we are creating these knowledge graphs on our platform. Uh, we are creating toolings and we are creating these LLMs. At the same time, we're working on AI DSL, we're working on Meta, we're working on all these other uh, parts of our OpenCog Hyperon framework. Then in phase two, we are entering the phase of neurosymbolic LLMs, where we'll create our LLM that is optimized and, and created and architected, especially for interaction with these knowledge graph and with distributed atom space. As an intermediate step to OpenCog Hyperon, fully fledged, which is not that far away anymore, um, and will take use of all these things that we have developed going up to this, from the first knowledge graph on our platform, from the first AI service developed on our platform, to the LLMs that we are creating, all will be able to plug in to the OpenCog Hyperon framework and benefit from each other, creating a very large and promising and ambitious system for developing artificial general intelligence. And we invite you to become part of that uh, journey. So in a year, maybe uh, the, the, the picture could look like this, where we have at the bottom our uh, layer one and layer two blockchains. So that's HyperCycle, uh, NewNet, Cardano, and perhaps others. Um, we'll have that computing layer in the middle, NewNet, and actually also HyperCycle will play a, a, a role there. Then we will have what we call the layer three, the internet of knowledge, where all these knowledge graphs can be accessible, are accessible and can be accessed by the LLMs of that moment and by OpenCock Hyperon and by all the services on our platform that can then plug in to our OpenCock Hyperon. And on top of that, we'll have a number of tools that will help you already now to link uh, the LLMs with the knowledge graphs and do all kinds of cool stuff today. So what where we are on our journey is we have the platform we have all the elements of opencock hyperon we have a number of uh, knowledge graphs there and one uh, very uh, interesting example i think is our flybase we have a license on uh, genetics from long lived flies and we are putting their genetic data into uh, distributed atom space up to 1 billion nodes already to give you uh, uh, an impression of the scalability of that uh, distributed atom space. And in our last, uh, we have a grant program called uh, Deep Funding. And in our last Deep Funding Round 3, we created a number of RFPs where we invited um, teams to create and to build 
uh, on our platform and to create LLMs and to create knowledge graphs and to create these tools on our platform. And you see here the a list of the awarded teams. I won't go through all of them. Uh, each has their uh, special angle and, and interest. And I'm very happy to have all of them rewarded by uh, deep funding. And they're, as we speak, they're building now on our platform. Um, but one of them stands out there, especially, and it's a well-known name here. Um, it's uh, the DeFi graph. So decentralized finance knowledge graph. And I'm very honored to, to see that this is a collaborative project by OpenMesh and by Neo4j and by MIT who are joining forces to create this DeFi graph on our platform. So if you are deciding to join our platform and to start building on our platform, you are definitely in good company here. So that's it for today. Um, thank you. I hope to see you in Deep Funding Round 4. We have a separate presentation on that and uh, where we tell you all about that. And um, yeah, if you have any, we, we don't have a date yet for Deep Funding Round 4. I definitely expect there will be more RFPs uh, for knowledge graphs and LLMs and, and such. But also if you want to create an AI server or a service or use an AI service on our platform, you can go to Deep Funding and um, stay uh, informed on all that's going on on deepfunding.ai and we will inform you when the next round will be starting. So I hope you found it impressive like I always do when I talk about it. Uh, I like to thank you for your presence and um, see you on deepfunding.ai. Thank you. Wow, I cannot believe we're already here on day two. What a great journey that we've embarked on together here. Uh, we've learned tons from groundbreaking demos, vibrant discussions, and I hope that you guys have had such a great time. Please stay tuned for more action-packed events going on for the rest of the day today and tomorrow. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Carlos Matallana. I work at Polygon GKBM. I'm the protocol team lead. Uh, today, I will basically explain what are all the Polygon GKBM components. But first of all, I want to just give a very brief introduction regarding uh, rollups. So, first of all, what is a rollup? At the very end, rollup is about to aggregate transactions exactly the same transactions that have been processed on layer one. We aggregate that, those transactions on layer two, and we compute those transactions of chain. So we execute those transactions of chain. And later on, we can kind of build a proof in order to prove that we did this um, execution correctly of chain. Okay, so at the very end, it's about taking a bunch of transactions, execute them, and then you prove that execution was uh, done correctly. In order to do that, uh, we use the, uh, the technology that is called uh, genome knowledge. And thanks to that technology, we can prove that the state transition is correct. This, uh, the important thing here is that uh, with that, we basically get all the security from the young and here now comes to the question that what are the main features of the lab? Okay, so basically the lab has two main features, and depending on that features, uh, you need you can classify all the labs. Basically, the very first feature is the data availability. Okay, the data availability is basically the data that is required in order to build the state from the genesis. What does it mean? It means that where I can find all the necessary data in order to rebuild the state tree from zero. Here is the, the, the main question here is who holds that data? If this data is on layer one, on Ethereum, I mean, no one can stop Ethereum. So the data will be always there. But if this data is held by a third party, by a server, and this server disappears, so 
you cannot reveal the state from the genesis. And, and this is very important. The second important uh, future is regarding ZK proof. There are two kind of uh, ZK proof. The first one is the validity proof, and the second one is the fraud proof. The first one is used uh, by the ZK rollups, and basically the validity proof means that you cannot do a state transition unless you prove that all the execution is correct. This is the validity proof. And the fraud proof is, okay, I want to do this state transition, and there is a bunch of people looking at this state transition, and they basically can challenge me in order to see that this is if this is the transition is correct or not. Okay. Depending of uh, in a rollup, depending if the datability is on layer one or first of all by the party of the secure proof is validity or fraud proof, uh, it has a classification that was made by Vitalik uh, back back then. And basically here in Polygon GKVM we are uh, in the GK rollup part. Okay so we use validity proof and we put all the data on chain. You may hear about the optimistic rollup, which basically the iterability goes on chain, but uh, it doesn't use validity proof, but fraud proofs. And the validium, which is basically, they, they use the validity proof, but the data availability is not on layer one, but is held probably uh, by a server or by a community members. Okay, so, uh, now we're going to see all the components inside the problem CDM. And I, I want to mention that it's not that uh, difficult and, and you will see because at the very end, the CDM is just a set of smart contracts and I would say two different uh, softwares, okay? The set of smart contracts are basically just three smart contracts, the bridge, the consensus mechanisms and the verifier. And then the software are basically three. The ZK node, which has to pass the sequence of aggregator, and then the proof. Okay, let's see a little bit in more of detail all the smart contracts that are involved. So the first one is the bridge. The bridge is basically a smart contract that handles asset transfers between layer one and layer two, or what we call layer X and layer Y. Okay, because this move of the assets uh, can happen between layer tools as well. Okay. This is very important. The, the, the second feature of the bridge is very important. <clears throat> it that uh, the bridge that we use in Polygon GPM is decentralized. Okay. Because it's verified to the zero knowledge, uh, through the zero knowledge proof. So you don't need to rely on anyone but in zero knowledge in order to have your deposit from layer one to layer two. Okay. There is a cool thing here uh, in the architecture of the bridge that we use is that the, the contracts uh, address is exactly the same in layer one and in all the layer twos. And it's very straightforward. I mean, uh, the bridge only has two functionalities, bridge and claim. I, I would say that the knowledge is bridge is to do kind of deposits from going to layer one to layer two. And then, in order to get your funds on layer two, then you need to do a claim. Okay, we base the architecture of the bridge is basically on an idea that uh, Vitalik post once, and uh, we took the idea when we bought the idea. Uh, and the idea is basically just to use trees uh, that we call global exit tree root, and very quickly, just when you uh, go to the bridge and just do a deposit. That you create a leaf in the market tree. Then, somehow, well, somehow through the zero knowledge proof, this root, okay, which will be the global exit root, will be go through the layer two. Once this root is on layer two, then you can perform the claim and you get your funds on layer two. Okay. Uh, we have based implementation in the zero to zero deposit contract, is exactly the same. And there are bridge over there in the space um, the, the, the approach that we use is like the lock admin so when you just deposit your funds on layer one they are locked in the bridge smart contract on layer one that uh, you mean exactly the same amount that you deposit on layer one but okay. okay what about the consensus uh, it's almost i mean it's very simple it only has i would say two calls also 
And these calls are made by two participants that are in the network, which is basically the sequencers and the aggregators. Okay. One is what we call the transaction batching, and the, the, the other one is the transaction validation. Okay. At the very end is the transaction batching, which uh, the work it comes from the sequencer. Basically, the sequencer just send transaction data to layer one, and that's it. Okay, this is called by a simple smart contract function, which we call send. And then the aggregator basically takes that data, performs the state transition, and then it calls the smart contract, the validate, validate batch function, which inside it has the verifier. So it basically verifies that uh, there is the correct state transition. Okay, so here, the, the, the important thing is the consensus smart contract has two different calls, and these two different calls are made by two entities. The sequencer, which just puts transaction data on layer one, and the aggregator, which basically verifies this uh, transaction data, the execution of this transaction. And as I mentioned, uh, here the aggregator does the validate batch. So in order to validate a batch, in order to validate transactions, the aggregator must provide a zero knowledge proof. And inside that call, there is an internal call to another smart contract, which is the verifier. The verifier defines the state transaction function. So given an, an input, deterministically, you uh, execute that uh, transaction, that input, and then you get an output. This is deterministically, and this is set by the verifier. This is probably the, the most important piece. The verifier assures a correct of the state transition, and it cannot be bypassed. So it's forced by the smart contract. So basically, the, the aggregator just submits a zero knowledge proof, and then it passes the, the, the verifier. OK, so I mentioned the sequencer and the aggregator. But there is also kind of a third piece. And basically, the SQL aggregator uh, uses uh, that third piece, which is basically the synchronizer. I mentioned also at the beginning that sequence aggregators are basically a piece of software. So you can think about the sequence aggregator as the get in Ethereum. So we have our GK node, which is basically the get for, for, uh, for the GKBM aggregator. <clears throat> okay. Well, as get, uh, this should be built in a, I would say, a modular way. So uh, we have different modules, uh, the repository. And well, as get, eh, you, you can run the synchronizer and the sequencer in a separate machine. You can run the synchronizer and the aggregator in another separate machine. And uh, the sequencer has the pool, has the RPC nodes. It looks very similar to get. Okay, but the, the important takeaway here is that. We built a software like Get, but for the Polygon CPM, and it has two entities, I would say, which is the sequencer and the aggregator. The sequencer, what is the job of the sequencer? The sequencer basically is getting a lot of transactions from users in layer two, and then the sequencer basically put those transactions on layer one. And here is very important to say that the sequencer only proposed transactions. It does not propose a state transition. Okay. The job of the aggregator is to receive those transactions from layer one, and then the aggregator computes this, uh, ensures that these transactions are executed correctly because it creates a validity proof. And this validity proof will be just sent to the smart contract on layer one. In order to do that, the aggregator needs a specialized hardware in order to create this ZK proof. And <clears throat> I will explain later on, uh, this specialized hardware basically is what we call the ZK proof. Okay, regarding, I would say that from user perspective, so what happened to your transaction when you are a user? So basically you send your transaction to the sequencer and the sequencer execute that transaction and then you receive like the receipt of the transaction. At that point, the transaction, I would say that the user needs to trust the sequencer. Okay. Then the sequencer 
will send your transaction to the smart contract through the sequence batches. Then the transaction becomes from that you don't need to trust the, sequ the sequence anymore because your transaction is already on layer one. Okay. And then the last state is the consolidated state. Consolidated state means that your transaction has been verified through the aggregator, through the SNARK. Okay. So, the, and, and this is very important from the perspective. There are three kind of uh, transactions. Trusted, you trust uh, the sequencer. Virtual, your transaction is already on layer one. And consolidated, your, your transaction is on layer one and it has been verified. And what I mentioned before, the aggregator basically use a software, a specific software, in order to comprove the knowledge proofs. And this software is what we call the ZKB proof. You, you can think, uh, it's a, a summary, very quick summary, but you can think about this uh, ZK prover about just adding a lot of constraints, a lot of polynomials, a lot of equations, filling all of them will with a uh, high complex uh, mathematical computation. Okay. When we do that, then we can create the zero knowledge proof later on and send it uh, to the smart contract. Later. Basically, as I mentioned, uh, the aggregator sends this uh, transaction data to the prover and the prover is in charge of building all these polynomial and later on the proof goes uh, again to the aggregator and the aggregator sends the proof to the smart contract layer. In order to do that basically uh, we kind of invented uh, what we call the ZK assembly language in order to define the ZKDM execution and the same exactly uh, we define another uh, language which is called PIL language, polynomial identity language and the purpose of this in order to, to define all the constraints, all the polynomials that the execution trace must fulfill. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so uh, thank you all. Hope you enjoy the, the slides and presentation. Thank you very much.
Hello everyone, I'm Sid and I lead developer relations for APAC at Neo4j. I'm super excited to talk to you all today at OpenDI Summit on the art of possible with graphs. It definitely feels like world is changing. There's a lot going on. New technologies are emerging. Global events are reshaping societies. Countries are making big political and economic shifts. The world is also becoming more connected and complex. People are working across borders and supply chains are reaching globally. Businesses are building networks and partnerships across departments and domains. It's a new reality of intertwined systems and collaborations. This all matters because data reflects the world. As things get more connected, data does too. The complexity of the real world shows up in our data. This new reality means our data landscape now holds endless connections waiting to be understood. Information is multiplying at astounding rates, full of hidden relationships and patterns. But with so much intertwining, it can get challenging to make sense of things using traditional approaches. That's the dilemma we face today. But it also creates huge opportunities for those ready to explore new ways of extracting meaning from data. It's not just that our world is more connected. Things also feel more unpredictable and fast changing. The challenges we face seem pretty daunting. It's like everything is speeding up, leaving us with less room for mistakes. There's an increased sense of urgency to make the right decisions quickly and adapt in real time. We have to get insights faster to keep up. The pressure is on for the organizations to be agile and forward thinking. Just look at the challenges we are up against today. Deploying AI so it's accurately grounding in our data. Securing systems against fraud. Overcoming supply chain disruptions. Building sustainable transportation networks. Moving medicine forward and solving the mysteries of disease or even pushing farther into space, the final frontier. These are all massively complex issues. But inside each one are opportunities to drive real human progress. Now, all these challenges have one thing in common, the insights to breakthroughs that are hidden in the connections. By uncovering the connections in data, we can map out how it all fits together, uncover hidden relationships, and see patterns emerge. The answers won't necessarily come easy, but if we explore the relationships in new ways, the potential for innovation is astounding. We can solve problems once thought impossible. The more we are, can understand how everything interacts, the more progress we can drive. That's the power of relationships. Uncovering relationships and connected data is the key to gaining deeper understanding and insights. When you connect the dots, you see so much more than the isolated data points and you see larger contexts emerge. You can spot behavioral patterns. You can discover subtle preferences that make all the difference. Think about how this helps companies today. Understanding context from connected data helps movies and music services suggest the perfect next show or song based on all your viewing history and days. Analyzing behavior patterns in network data allows fraud teams in separate to separate legitimate actions from malicious activity. You can uncover preferences hidden in customer data that can let retailers provide hyper personalized recommendations and optimize placement of products. Mapping out connections in supply chain data enables companies to quickly identify and resolve bottlenecks. They can optimize delivery routes to save costs and emissions, keeping the goods flowing efficiently. Now, all these relationships transform your isolated data points into an interconnected web of meaning. This deeper understanding and situation awareness unlocks breakthroughs and innovations that weren't possible before at data points when they were left alone. Now, many of today's most successful companies understand that connections matter, that when data is interconnected, relationships and insights emerge. Look at Google, for example, their entire business is built on mapping out relationships between places, people, and topics in their knowledge graph. Without those connections, Google search won't be what it is today. We would probably be still asking Alta Vista or Ask Jeeves. Ask Jeeves, right? Other tech giants like Facebook and LinkedIn thrive on social connections and relationships in their data. And companies like Airbnb and Netflix analyze web of relationships to recommend homes and movies. The point is, today's leaders recognize that data doesn't exist in isolation, right? There are connections everywhere waiting to be explored, and when you uncover those relationships, it leads to winning products and transformative insights. 
Now you may be thinking, well, those are some of the world's tech companies, like largest tech companies. I'm not Google or Apple. Well, you don't have to be a tech giant when it comes to connected data. Innovation leaders across industries are realizing they have a gold mine of relationships waiting to be uncovered through billions of connections in their own data. These connections can lead to game-changing insights and innovations. Trucking leader, for example, JB Hunt, turned to Neo4j to unlock real-time visibility across its fleet of 20,000 tractors and over 100,000 trailers and containers. Now, by modeling equipment as a graph, JB Hunt gained operational insights to optimize routes, reduce costs and emissions, and improve driver safety. So the Neo4j solution, which they, they deployed into their database, had 6 million fewer empty miles per year that led to 40% more intermodal capacity, $1.6 million in safe driver bonuses, 3.5 million metric tons less emissions. The same potential exists in your organization's data as well. The connections are there. You just need the right tools and mindset to explore relationships in new ways. When you shift perspective to focus on how everything interacts, you will uncover extraordinary possibilities you didn't know were possible looking at isolated data points. And as we just covered, the most innovative organizations in the world are unlocking huge value by uncovering relationships in connected data. And companies like JB Hunt are gaining a real competitive advantage in this space, but most struggle to tap this potential for a key couple of reasons. Now, one reason is that the systems weren't built for connected data, but it's not only a technology problem, it's also because it requires a shift in mindset. Having a graphy fanny where you realize you need to explore how everything is interconnected, not just the data points. And then when you need to realize that we are all here because we're trying to solve really hard problems that have never been solved before. The reality is past approaches to data were not built to handle relations, uh, handle the challenges that we face today. Deriving insights from massive, fast changing, interconnected data sets from supply chains to fraud detections. And you must be talking about relational databases that they were there, they revolutionized the transaction systems and structured data storage, but they have a very rigid tabular architectures, not the flexible and evolving data modeling that is needed to manage interconnected and often complex data structures. Trying to manage and uncover relationships across billions of data connections using old relational approaches results is slow, painful, and expensive. You end up trying to fit a round problem into a square rectangle relational box, creating bottlenecks, right? So look at these examples uh, where data structures, you can see on the right, uh, scale them to the size of your organization. Then imagine you, you to normalize this data into a SQL database, a relational database with SQL. I mean, I wouldn't wish that for my worst enemy even, right? Now, connections in data contain context and meaning. You know, traditional databases strip out connections. Relational databases, when they say the word relational, there's no relations between the data, right? Craft databases organize data as nodes and relationships, not as rows and columns. And that's the value proposition of a craft database. When you start exploring beyond one or two levels of connections in your data, a relational database starts to lag. It takes too much compute power. Fraud rings are not simple, you know that. You need to explore multiple levels of connections. Supply chain has dozens and dozens of levels. You just can't do that in a reasonable time with RDBMS. It becomes a huge bad job that may take multiple days. For those of you who are developers, we call this index-free agency. Graph databases are purpose-built to serve the needs of the connected world and the data that, power, that powers it. Unlike other databases, Native graph databases capture and directly store the relationships between the data. This means that they deliver consistently fast performance even when traversing multiple connections. Differentiation is we are one of the very few systems doing analytical and operational in the same database. We are a native graph database. So how do we do it? How do we improve your models and predictions? First, we offer the world's largest catalog of graph algorithms to allow you to deep experimentation and analysis from simple search all the way to unsupervised machine learning. Next, 
we provide an in-memory analytics workspace so you can work on different parts of the graph and different analysis at the same time all using a native python client in between lastly we have to bring analysis into your existing traditional machine learning pipelines through graph embeddings so graph technology is uniquely positioned to answer essential questions that drive tremendous business value like what's most important right now graph algorithms rapidly identify priority nodes based on connectivity patterns and relationship strengths bringing focus to the links that matter most what's unusual or suspicious powerful link analysis and community detection techniques uncover anomalies and risk hidden in connections that rules based approaches miss detect frauds earlier or identify new approaches faster what's likely to happen next the innate power of graph data models unlock super superior machine learning driven forecasts and predictions these advanced capabilities allow you to explore the hidden connections and signals within massive complex data in entirely new ways now when it comes to large language models like gpt they show incredible promise for de delivering natural and intuitive ai however their unpredictability can lead to inaccurate responses that undermine trust knowledge cut off can inherit bias through training data hence knowledge graphs uh, provide this ideal solution for grounding llms in facts and relationships by linking to the real world entities and context knowledge graphs reduce the risk of hallucinations and errors and the explicit factual knowledge ensures llms provide accurate information connected to implicit relationships enables factual relevant and contextual responses together explicit and implicit knowledge graphs can combine the best of the both worlds users get reliable fact based answers along with thoughtful responses tailored to the context anchoring generative ai to curated knowledge graphs allow organizations to benefit from the conversational capabilities of llms with improved accuracy context and explainability we believe knowledge graphs are a foundational technology improving llms allowing organizations to confidently infuse applications with next gen ai grounded in relationships and facts the limitations of traditional relational databases became apparent when it comes to exploring multi layer levels of connections in data as the number of connections increase graph continues to provide millisecond performance while relationship databases struggle and collapse under the weight of data complexity and data challenges today are increasingly complex with many layers of connections For example most supply chains today have dozens and dozens of levels managing a supply chain in real time is unfeasible with an app backed by a relational database or consider fraud rings where you need to explore multiple levels of connections to expose individuals with certain shared characteristics modern fraud detection is simply possible impossible with legacy relation systems with the ability to natively store graph uh, natively store query and analyzing uh, analyze your relationships graph databases fuel a new generation of intelligent applications simply not possible with other technologies examples include hyperbolic recommendation generation uh, your knowledge graphs uh, intelligent knowledge graphs etc uh, that you see out there today neo4j graph powered applications are used by over 1600 organizations including 75% of the fortune 500 as you can imagine all of these sectors have significant networks of people places goods and services that graph is helping them understand better the complexity of the real world shows up in our data looking ahead organizations that embrace a relationship first approach will have a competitive advantage and transform how they extract value from the data predictive models hyper personalization integrated knowledge these capabilities and more become possible when we view data as a network of relationships not rigid and siloed structures i invite you to join us on this journey to be to a more connected future rethink what's possible by making sense of data through relationships the most ch meaningful challenges we face today all have answers hidden within connections now when it comes to the developer community neo4j loves community and open source open sourceness there's so many ways to get involved and get started 
connect with developers, building relationship powered apps through our in-person meetups, forums, and GitHub. Uh, you can speak at, at our meetups as well. That's a link uh, that you can fill up a quick form. You can skill up on graph technologies and cipher with our graph academy courses. 20,000 people have already completed them. What are you waiting for? Just go and complete. We recently concluded Nodes 23, uh, our annual gathering of graph pioneers. Deep dive on all things graph, all session recordings are already available on our YouTube channel. Well, that's it from my side. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me and have a great rest of your day at OpenDI Summit. I'm sure there are a lot of learnings from here to take back from. Thank you. Bye. I've been learning so much from the panels and keynotes at this conference, but what really makes a conference valuable can be those interpersonal relationships you make. That's why OpenMesh has created side stages where you can engage in intimate Q&As, participate in networking discussions, explore partnership opportunities, and delve into recruitment initiatives. There's a link below if you want to check out the schedule. Also, if you want to contribute to OpenMesh, it's more than just an initiative. It's a vibrant community of forward thinkers, creators, and visionaries. All of the job openings for OpenMesh are posted on Greenhouse at the other link below. Right now, they're looking for people at all levels who are looking for a diverse, inclusive, and growth-oriented environment. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Ali, I'm one of the Lilypad co-founders and I'm excited to be here today as open data and infrastructure aren't just an interesting and kind of topical field of study and growth, but to me how we build or don't build these pieces of technology is going to be absolutely essential to ensuring we provide equitable access to technology and the web in future years and it's a major driver behind the Lilypad project as well. Um, so what is this lily pad thing besides a lovely pond plant Monet used to paint? Um, well, let's go back to basics a little bit. If we think about what the modern web stat looks like, it's all about data. Something I probably don't need to tell any one of you here at an open data summit. But we either want to move data around, store data, or make data useful. And these three components, networking, storage, and compute, form the basis of pretty much everything we do in today's connected era. Um, so far though, compute has kind of been a missing piece of the decentralized infrastructure story. Uh, with a few kind of experimental exceptions, and that's likely for a few reasons. Uh, there's a lot of complexities involved in building a fully distributed compute network, um, and the research is really bleeding edge still. And secondly, as a space, we probably just weren't quite ready yet. There were more pressing problems to solve, internet scale storage, friendly UX, or scaling solutions as well. Um, Thirdly, the exponential explosion of AI and ML into the mainstream has kind of put the focus back in onto the hardware required for AI workloads. And so the demand for compute is currently incredibly high. In fact, there's currently a global shortage of GPUs to perform compute jobs like training and running AI models. And this is something that decentralized physical infrastructure networks and blockchains are uniquely capable of providing and incentivizing at scale. Um, so this is really why I think the next frontier for computing in Web3 is at this data layer. To build these truly kind of decentralized applications that can run at internet scale and reach mainstream adoption requires more efficient off-chain computation that isn't just a centralized backend though. And this is where we can start to both kind of make data truly useful as well as showcase the value of distributed networks to new users and even to the famous next billion that we're all looking to onboard here in Web3. And this is definitely one of the reasons we're seeing more developers and teams in the space start to tackle this part of the infrastructure stack and why I've dubbed it the now frontier of Web3 as well. Because in order to create these kind of internet scale decentralized applications we want to see break through to a mainstream audience, we're going to need truly internet scale permissionless compute platforms. So this is the space and future we're hoping the Lilypad network can play a big part in uh, building. 
So with LilyPad, we're aiming to provide this permissionless distributed compute network that enables these internet scale computing jobs and also unlocking idle compute path power. So at its most basic, LilyPad is really an efficient peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for compute jobs. Uh, in practical terms, LilyPad enables folks running hardware to join the network and be paid for contributing their hardware to it, while enabling developers and consumers to connect with the network to run all sorts of arbitrary compute tasks as jobs. And that includes our current focus of AI inference jobs like Stable Diffusion and open source LLMs, as well as ML training jobs like LoRa and Minstrel. And we want to make sure that that is easy for people to use as well. So you shouldn't need a degree in AI to access state-of-the-art open source models for your next app idea. In fact, it should be as easy as any web UI out there makes it. Equally, you shouldn't need to pay a fortune to keep a cloud GPU running so that you don't lose access to it for the training job you need to run once a week. So sure, you can run some powerful compute jobs. But you can already do that with AWS and APIs. Why bother with this whole distributed network thing? Well, my friend, there's both practical and ideological reasons for distributed compute platforms. Allow me to fill you in. Uh, firstly, I happen to agree with this great Tim Berners-Lee quote in that the access we have to the internet, as well as the restraints we have on using it, depending on like our geography, our country of residence, Oh, our resources, these are incredibly important parts of what defines our modern day human experience and our, I would go as far as to say, human rights. And it's why I believe it's incredibly important that we're making sure that any tech infrastructure we're building, as I said earlier in the piece, enables and even enforces these values of fairness and of trustlessness and openness that we need and that really pins the a real goal uh, underpins the real goal for tech and scientific breakthroughs. And that that is that of improving the human condition. Uh, and I, if I can take a little bit of liberty here with Tim's quote, I think it's never been more important that we're building open infrastructure paths than it is now with AI and ML really poised to massively disrupt how we work, live and play. Um, currently though, AI breakthroughs are very much situated with large central players that have access to vast amounts of compute power and data sets. Uh, both the models and our access to them are either a black box, they're rate limited, or they have other questions on their origin. Uh, to me though, in the same way that uh, one company really shouldn't control access to scientific breakthroughs, central entities should not control access to AI advancements or the data sets they're trained on. Uh, and shouldn't be able to decide on the regulations and rules around that. In fact, we should all be stakeholders in its future and we should all have the capability to check the data and algorithms for biases or security issues and to have a say in that collective future direction. Uh, and Peter Wang does an amazing job of explaining uh, this in this talk up here as well that I would recommend you check out. What's also interesting to me, though, is that according to this leaked Google article, and I loved reading this, it's clear that open source AI and ML is already outcompeting the centralized versions. And that's because they're able to define use cases and to fine tune more easily on way less data points. So they're also able to target where the common good lies. So much like Arduino revolutionized hardware and IoT development by giving hobbyists access, giving people and developers the tools for AI and access to compute power really speeds up solutionizing and, it, and innovation in the space as well. They know where the problems are, they just need the tools to solve them. Um, so this brings up a problem which Elon Musk has so eloquently described here though, and that's access to GPUs. And it's a problem that even open API is experienced at the moment. So access to GPUs at a reasonable price is a key issue for open source AI and ML, and also for new market entrants to be competitive in the open market. Um, GPUs are everywhere though. We just aren't allocating them to the market efficiently. And this is not surprising given the centralized nature of much of the world's infrastructure. 
which uh, by this summit's introduction was quoted as 90%. And fun fact, I immediately signed up when I read the intro sentence for this summit. So uh, yeah, it, it's a big problem and it's one we're looking to solve. But anyway, this is where permissionless distributed networks really shine. Uh, that is in creating uh, open peer-to-peer -peer networks. It's their ability to create these efficient marketplaces with open participation and fair incentive structures. So not unlike the way that Uber disrupted the taxi industry uh, back in the day with a peer-to-peer -peer model, I would go as far to say either. Um, so, uh, this accessible hardware via an efficient open peer-to-peer -peer marketplace is one of the uh, practical reasons and benefits for um, a distributed network as well. Um, so Lilypad is also really great for efficiency of pricing and distribution too. Currently, the market dynamics um, space is, sorry, currently we're largely in a vertically integrated oligopoly and compute costs are prohibitively high for new entrants in AI because of this. Uh, instead, Lilypad enables these coordination layers to match the demand for CPU and GPU with supply, and that brings in better market dynamics and therefore cheaper prices. So just to recap, in both practical and philosophical terms, distributed compute networks like Lilypad can really provide a host of benefits for participants on all sides of the market. Let's dig into how we're actually making all this happen though and how far along we are too. Uh, so the tech details, uh, we're currently at Lilypad Aurora uh, Testnet. We are live and running. Um, so <laughs> that was a big thing to get to. So uh, we're really happy to be there as well. Uh, so Lilypad combines this off-chain compute implementation details while providing on-chain uh, coordination and verification. It's built in Go and Solidity and it's currently running on IPC, which is a super fast scaling uh, L2 out of Protocol Labs. It uses its own ERC20 token, which we've dubbed LP, to pay for services and gas and it's fully EVM compatible. So in the future, we'll probably more than likely roll it out to other EVM based chains and become multi-chain as well. Um, if we have a look at the uh, tech stack, the Lilypad kind of layers stack, uh, we, if we start at the bottom, we've got the code libraries. This is the underlying SD code of the network. Uh, on top of that is the smart contracts. This is the on-chain part of our network and what gives us these kind of on-chain guarantees and verifiability, or well, part partly the verifiability that we are looking for. Uh, so these smart contracts handle deal agreements, dispute resolution, uh, and job and escrow payments. And it's where all the job inf deal information is stored. Uh, thirdly, we have the Lilypad network itself. Uh, most of this happens off-chain. This is where all the services live. It's where jobs are discussed, mediated, agreed on, and run. Um, and then we have uh, recently uh, released this kind of uh, abstraction value layer called uh, Lilypad AI Studio. And I'll show you a little bit of this a bit later, uh, but this is a web interface for running Lilypad AI jobs and it provides this seamless web two experience for users. Uh, so making it really easy for people to interact and get to know this, um, the, get to know Lilypad really. Um, so I was talking a little bit before about job verification. How do we know that uh, one of these peers on the network has actually run the job correctly and is returning the correct result? Well, in order to make sure that jobs are performed as specified in the network, uh, Lilypad has opt for, opted for a game theory approach um, to this compute verification and it uses optimistic reproducibility uh, to incentivize good actors and discourage cheating and collusion in the network. Basically, you can kind of think of it like a uh, train uh, ticket inspector. Um, you know, if, if the price of a ticket is uh, reasonable uh, and if the chances of a ticket inspector uh, coming along are high enough, then you will probably do the right thing and um, buy a ticket. Uh, so this is kind of, the, it's a bit more complicated than that, but uh, you'll probably do the right thing and, and buy a ticket if those conditions are correct. So we'll get back uh, the right answer from this. You can also challenge that statement as well. So um, there's, a, there's a few more moving parts in that, but that's the basic analogy that works for me. Um, 
Okay, so in order to verify jobs though, they currently need to have one outcome. So all jobs in the network are currently required to be deterministic to enable this verification, although we're moving to a non-deterministic uh, version of this as well. So to achieve this objective, uh, while also maintaining the flexibility that we want uh, for people to be able to create and run their own jobs in the network, Lilypad employs a module system. So a module is just the specification for a compute job to run on Lilypad, and it's basically just a GitHub uh, repo. Uh, so there's currently several modules available to use um, that we've created, uh, that, or the community has also uh, created as well. We've had several um, contributed by community members. Uh, some of these modules are an LLM fast chat, there's LoRa fine tuning, which allows you to tune a new model based on inputs from an IPFS CIT. There's of course stable diffusion text to image, uh, and you can check out the docs if you want to build your own module to run on Lilypad as well. Um, all right, now that I've kind of like tempted you with tech, let me show you how it actually operates. Um, so user details. Where, where, where's my AI, please? Uh, so users and developers have kind of access to uh, all these modules via three different uh, methods. You can use the Lilypad CLI, so via your terminal on your uh, computer. You can use smart contracts, so you could integrate this in your uh, decentralized apps already uh, and, and uh, via a smart contract. Or you could use the Lilypad AI Studio, which I spoke a little bit about before, which is a, a web interface uh, and is hosted on lilypad.tech. Um, I'm going to get you started with the CLI version, or this is also relevant to um, the smart contract version as well. So if you want to get set up, 